our old notes about that just to make sure that we're um, on, you know, keeping in track with the conversations we have had uh, in the past. But uh, I, so I can look through our Google Drive and take responsibility for that. But um, okay, great. Uh, yeah, but I'd love to just go further and deeper and proceed <laughs> with that. Great. Well, I have this uh, ratio blockchain article open, which I sent to Marco, and there's no reason I couldn't add you um, to. There is a it's a uh, an idea called the Internet of Value, um, and they've got something called social earnings ratio integration, <laughs> uh, and they do that using something called a ratio blockchain. So. The technical aspects of that, I would still need to do a, a deeper dive on, on this paper. Um, but just to be aware of it as a resource. Yeah. Could you summarize kind of what your takeaways are? From um, no, I honestly, I, I haven't gone deep enough even to summarize it at this point. I, for me, I guess my background is that I've, I, I had a good, I've had a good friend who I wanted to bring in here, but he, he's not coming in at this point who, who got me sort of learning about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, but it never seemed to sort of work for me to invest, which sort of I missed a big opportunity, I guess, like maybe some of others of us have, but there, it never seemed to quite come together. Um, maybe being Canada based also. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the course of talking with him over the years, just, it was, our dialogue was a lot about, you might say the psycho spirituality of money in general. And, and then, uh, specifically I did an interview with, um, and I still have that raw interview stuff, Marco, and I still do want to turn it into some kind of podcast to make it usable. Um, with there's a, an integral investor, so uh, more on the conscious capitalism side of the street, named um, Mariana Bozazan, who started something called Aqua Capital. And I did an interview with her on the topic of the democratization of investing a, a couple years back. Um, and so I'm just kind of giving you some narrative of sort of where I've been with this. And then um, yeah, and then more recently seeing this, you know, this way that it's, it seems like it's getting easier on the technical side to make a cryptocurrency if, if you want to have your own token. And so when I saw that Waves blockchain, um, that, you know, piqued my curiosity. And then the one other piece is uh, what Sean Hargens is working in, something called Meta Capital. Now, is there a place on Zoom to, th- to throw links if I want to throw some? Yeah, you could throw it in the chat, uh, Derwin. Okay. So, um, Sean Hargens um, is doing uh, quite a bit in this space now, too, and he's got something called Meta Capital. Um, and he's working with a woman, too, who's a currency innovator type person as well. Um, so they've got 10 types of capital, four bottom lines, four types of impact using, you know, he's using the quadrants, he's using the integral Ken's or the, you know, the eight zones or the four quadrants. Um, and they had a course and I, you know, they haven't run it again, but my intention was to actually take that course. Interesting. Um, um. <laughs> I want to share something really quick, which is my friend just published this book. It just came out um, a week ago. Uh, Adam Adam Brock is a Denver-based permaculturalist, and and, uh, I'll be teaching. I've I've worked with him on the Denver Permaculture Guild, and and, um, we'll be teaching uh, an inaugural social permaculture design course with him. Um, But I bring it up because one of the five sections – it's actually a pattern language for um, uh, human social systems permaculture, as opposed to like land-based permaculture. 
pattern language. So it's a pattern language for human social systems. And there's a whole section on economies and on different types of capital. Um, so I'm, I'm just reading through it. So far, it's been great. I have to read the section on organizations because that's what I'm co-teaching in a couple weeks. But uh, I, the next section following the organization section is economies. And so uh, there might be some things in there. I, I expect that there will be because it's a very comprehensive research project that he did uh, to bring together a pattern language of human phenomena. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I, I look forward to sharing that as well in terms of types of capital. That's what caught my eye from the meta capital right. project. So, uh, uh, I'm going to be, I'll do this meeting outside. I hope you guys don't mind. It's just, it seems insane to be in front of a screen right now. I mean, I am in front of a screen looking at my iPhone, but the screen is taking up a relatively smaller uh, proportion of my overall like kind of panorama uh, than when I'm sitting in my studio, like enclosed in four walls with the ceiling over me and just kind of in that, that apartment. Um, and I've, it's occurring to me from just this sort of feeling out that we're doing now uh, that we could look at this question of a currency and of the particular currency that we're here to discuss, a community currency, i.e. a community for a, a currency for a defined organization called Cosmos, mm -hmm. um, that we could look at that uh, at the conceptual level in terms of you know, different theoretical models of uh, how money works or how money could work uh, for different kinds of social groups. We could look at it at a technical level in terms of the blockchain and um, potentially the blockchain. And that's one technology, but basically how it would, it would be implemented um, uh, in, you know, in our community or in any. Um, but then there are these other layers of the question that to me, I think are more um, one that we're more qualified to, to, to even address. Uh, but, but two also that are uh, sort of more fundamental, like that we have to like get to the root of before we talk about like how a, a currency could work theoretically or how it could be implemented technically. Mm -hmm. And those would be the kind of fundamental questions like why, why do we feel we need a currency? What purposes do we want it to serve? Uh, what does it mean to us personally? Like what would it mean to have this entity in our lives, right, that we're transacting with? Uh, whatever it's called. So let's say it's called Litcoin or Integral Bucks or whatever we call it, it becomes a thing, right? So it takes on yeah. uh, a certain personality, just like, uh, you know, just like a character in a story. So it has like an impulsive level to it. Like it serves an immediate need. It has a, a sort of immediate effect, a magical uh, existence, I think, uh, you know, you could say, but then it has this mythical existence. And then it has the, the rational and the conceptual and the technical existences as well. And I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm called, I feel that, yeah, I'd like to talk about all those levels. <laughs> but I think that we have to talk about the, the magical and the mythical levels first, uh, because they're really kind of what's drawing us to it. And they're really like what makes it an issue, like what makes it like something worth talking about. Yeah. I see the creation of a currency in our systems as so, so important on those mythical levels because, you know, the ways in which the currency would be utilized is, is the writing of our story collectively. Um, the currency as a means of value, means of exchange, and means of um, circulating energy in, in the system is paramount and and that even more so than the actual verbal conversations that we have like that is what writes the collective story um i want litcoin or whatever it's called to be an expression of meaningful value on the part of its users which means that if we look at how litcoin was is being circulated we actually see what our users value and we and in a sense um the 
the, the right kinds of conversation, or at least on a, on a level of salience to the particular users are happening and the right kinds of initiatives are being resourced and, and this and that. And when I say right kind, I just kind of mean on an emergent level of just what our community wants through the use of this currency. And that that is um, really, really important to begin to understand the characteristics of this group, this community, and um, and how they are enacting kind of their purposes through Litcoin. Um, so all that being said, I think it's important that we tie Litcoin to um, to our mission and to certain ethical standards in terms of the kinds of behavior that we suspect would lead toward realization of our mission, you know, like not being, not, not pretending to be neutral. Like we're just going to throw this out there and let, you know, everybody play with it, but really designing it from a place of, so we've thought about this and we, we really thought about what we're trying to do here and we want to tie it to, um, like we suspect that if blank, then blank, you know, like we, we're going to have a logic model or some kind of theory of action that we apply in the creation of Litcoin. And then we test those assumptions against how it's actually being used by collecting data on how it's actually being used. And we make, we make adjustments. Um, so, you know, I really think this is an opportunity to bring together the brilliant creative minds that we have to try to design something that um, won't accidentally create perverse incentives, you know, that, that will uh, actually effectuate our mission being realized. You know, like I think it would be, there's certain mechanisms that the currency could have that um, it would be interesting to invite people to really think, really contemplate and think about like what effects that this might have and is this the right mechanism to choose um, looking at the best works that, that are coming out of this field because there's so much innovation going on with this right now. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll let you respond, Derwin, and I'll also maybe make just a meta commentary about our conversation here. So it's nice, we have a triad and I, 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 one thing I've been paying attention to as I've been doing more conversations on this weekly basis and then through the book groups and then through everything, all the discussion threads on, on the forum is that different, different shapes and the different personalities or presences that show up, like have a, have each have their own dynamic and each uh, also um, carry like the seeds of learning. There's always something to learn uh, from the just contingent way that people come together and talk. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, I that's just brilliant. After last night, it's about how the best group sizes are between four and seven people, just because of how many dyads, how many dyad pairs are possible. And when you get big, too big, it gets really fucking complex. That's, that's so interesting. Right. Um, everybody has a one-to-one -one as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. Um, and, and what I'm, so I, I have a certain, you know, I have my own perspective on that being like, you know, one of those entities there, but also the, the conversations have resonances and echoes with each other. So like what, even just in this moment, I, I've, I've touched on the same theme of group size with uh, Philippa Reese uh, through just a private message that um, came up in the context of um, editorial stuff for metapsychosis. So it all has these like echoes and resonances and part of, I think um, the learning in even just doing a conversation like this is paying attention to like what patterns emerge and where they go, what they do and what, um, what wants to arise, um, but also what we can choose out of the kind of chance uh, that is, I guess, inevitable. Like when, you know, people don't, you know, just in reality, <laughs> but, but also by the nature of like the organic kind of unfolding of, of how we're doing this. Um, so anyway, I mean, that was just a kind of a meta meta commentary. And I do, I do, I, mean, I, I do think that like that having these conversations and um, like recording them and reflecting on them and like seeing how they interconnect, like that there could be a synthetic process through that uh, by which we get to like, we kind of like feel out, like we get to like the core of the issue. Like we get to like what we, 
what we um, really can do together or want to do together, like what would really serve uh, us individually uh, as well as collectively. Um, I mean, it's part of what we're talking about is even the language for how we talk about what we're talking about. So it all gets, you know, kind of meta and hyper reflexive, but at the same time, I think going through it and, and actually becoming present like in these dialogues uh, is part of what is going to help clarify like why we're even talking in the first place, because that becomes, that's actually a mystery to me uh, at some times, you know, and I have to, I have to reflect on myself, like remind myself, like, what, it, what is this all about? Like, what are we really going for? Like, what, are, what's really arising? Uh, so there's a, a work of interpretation. It gets, I don't know. I think about it a lot. And um, anyway, I mean, I, when it comes to Litcoin, uh, I'm just, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm kind of seeing it in that constellation of, of concerns and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I want to borrow a word you used to clarify what I was saying before, just real quick. And I totally want to hand it off to, to Darwin after this, but um, I see a currency as a language in and of mm-hmm. itself. It's a, it's a language that expresses what we value and it's a different language than spoken language or different frameworks from which we each are referencing or bringing into our conversations, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and I'd be interested in studying how that language works and, and obviously building the syntax and building, <laughs> building the language itself. So that's actually a really good way of, of, the, of, of putting it. That would mean it's a conversation as well. It is. Uh, yeah. S- what do you think Darwin? <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm just, uh, first, I, you know, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I know that you guys have a, you know, you have a strong working relationship already. So, so in, in some ways I'm sort of just listening in and, and sort of seeing, uh, where I might fit. Um, and, you know, there's just some kind of key terms, words that are coming out. Uh, you know, you talk about collective narrative, um, you know, I have a background working as a therapist and just yesterday I was talking to a friend from graduate school about, and she asked me, you know, what would you do if you were to go back to do a PhD on this now? And I said, well, probably I try to do a meta narrative therapy. Um, mm. Because in fact, see, the, the, the thing for me is that I, you know, narrative therapy was one, is one of the main sort of postmodern therapy forms. The other one being solution focused. And, and so they sort of break down and sort of left brain and right brain a little bit. Um, and I always avoided narrative action <laughs> therapy. So I've had to explore why that is. <laughs> uh, probably has something to do with my dad, who's a writer. And, um, <laughs> so, and an artist. Um, so... So, but I, I really, that's kind of, I'm, I'm quite interested in that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've been rereading the, um, you know, Wilbur's framework on integral semiotics. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I, I keyed in on what you were saying, Carolyn, about uh, collective narrative. Um, that the money would be a part of that and a means of enacting purpose. And then also that you've, you've got some social science skills like developing a logic model and testing it and stuff like that. Um, which is great. I mean, if you, uh, I'm guessing you've done that kind of work before, or that's part of what you're going to be teaching, right? Is it? Um, no. Uh, but I was, I think I was saying that for, for the developers of, of this currency, um, you know, or for the developers of Cosmos, if they're not the same people that they probably are, um, uh, we, we might want to develop our theory of theory of action in the sense that, you know, in the sense of, of choosing and designing the mechanisms by which the currency functions, we would make some educated guesses. We would make some if then statements, you know, if, 
if right. this mechanism is in place, then we expect these effects to occur in the system. Right. And um, if we can model that and map that out before we, you know, as much as we can before we implement, then at least we can test our assumptions against what unfolds in reality if we look at the data after it's implemented. Um, but, but it'll be a way for us to maybe begin the process of filtering what strategies, what tactics we're going to actually use in the currency because there's so much yeah. innovation out there. You, you know, I think I should maybe try to do some translating because I've talked a lot with Caroline, uh, you, and I've talked a lot with Derwin, you, and I have, I think, a sense of like what our like shared needs are. And um, I probably have kind of distinct languages where we've kind of discussed it in distinct languages. For example, Derwin and I share a lot of background in integral theory. And so right. everything he refers to regarding Ken Wilbur or Aquil or that kind of a thing, I just get it like immediately. Uh, and, you know, the same would hold vice versa. Whereas uh, Caroline, you and I have talked more about cooperative or organization and uh, the sort of the sort of system dynamics and social dynamics and uh, that's a kind of emergent language unto itself, which we're, you know, which, you know, you're still working on and we're still, still working on, but hasn't necessarily translated over, over to Derwin automatically. So, but what I think we share in common, like if, if there's something com that we might commonly sense, I think I know on a personal level that I uh, have, uh, you know, I have a need for a new kind of economics. Like I have a need to, uh, to, to find it, to, to break through this money system that we're, we're currently, I think, being strangled by. Uh, and I mean, that, that has been a very painful and deeply felt need uh, because, um, it, because there's a constant stress. It really touches on the survival aspect of ourselves, right? It touches on that sort of magical impulsive layer where, you know, if you're constantly feeling stressed by not having enough money or wondering, you know, how you're going to get your next... Um, you know, your next client or whatever it is. And as if, as a father, particularly, uh, which I know that Derwin is as well, and having a sense of responsibility for the household, and for, you know, maintaining a livelihood, um, that's a huge stressor. And part of what I, part of like what the impulse for, for Litcoin or for doing a currency is to shift, like to shift our way of being economically from one paradigm to another and to to use and that's not of, of course to say yet that litcoin is itself a replacement for the dollar or something like that it's not to make a grandiose claim like that but it's it's meant to be from my you know from my in the in the terms of my personal needs as a person uh a step it's meant to be something practical you know that we could do to begin to model new ways of having the particular conversation, you know, that we call money. Um, and I know that Caroline, you know, that we're, we're all in the same boat, basically. Uh, we're all in the same kind of economy and, you know, we, we each have different configurations of like what our respective obligations are, our commitments, our debts, our in, incomes, et cetera, et cetera. But we're basically still dealing with the same problem, generally speaking. And so part of the purpose of Cosmos is to figure out, figure out how to um, solve that problem, at least for the people that are participating in it, you know, and then to make our experience a template perhaps or uh, a set of blueprints or lessons or something that could be shared, something to be replicated that others can learn from and implement for themselves, if not working with us. But like, it's, I, I want to get out of the capitalist trap and like, I think that that's a relatively real thing, uh, you know, and, and even though uh, it arises in emptiness and it's empty and uh, nonetheless, it's part of my lived, a lived experience, which I think we all resonate with each other on at some level or another, you know, which I'll invite you to clarify in whatever way you want to. But yeah. I want to make the connection between Litcoin and a cooperative organization and then our own livelihoods. Uh, sustaining us to do the work that we want to do. Uh, I have a particular trajectory. I have a particular destiny and passion, like things I feel I need to do as an artist and a writer. Caroline, I know, does as well. Derwin does as well as a 
therapist or maybe a, a kind of, you know, suppressed podcaster or suppressed writer, like working through issues with his father or whatever. But um, I want to enable that to happen. So how can we connect this conversation and really all our conversations with some kind of shared purpose that each of us can relate to in the way that we need to? Yeah. Okay. So bouncing off of that idea to touch um, back to our history of conversations, um, the currency or having an alternative currency would have, would serve multiple purposes. One of them is that it, um, as, as kind of a, a shared language, particular to the cosmosphere, it is a means of increasing and diversifying interactions. And the more interactions in a system, the stronger the network, the stronger the system. Um, two, as Marco points out, many of our target audience or our target user base, our target membership, are people who are undervalued by the current economic order because they are artists, they're creative, they're whatever, and that is um, not being properly valued in our kind of ethical viewpoint that that's, they're not being honored. And by putting people together and inviting them to exchange things of value, um, we hopefully will create value that can be exchanged for dollars at some point, and it creates economic impact in the lives of our members because yeah. they're exchanging within the system, but they can cash it out. It creates an economic valuing of, um, of our members' time and energy, you know? Um, so there's that aspect. And then there's also um, something that we have talked about that I think needs to be mentioned is we want the currency to be diversively able to be applied, meaning there might be some mechanisms constraining how it's exchanged, but in a large part, we want people to be able to do a lot of things with it. <laughs> they can pay someone directly. Um, they can barter with it. They can trade it. They can, they can thank somebody with it. They can like something with it. Um, they can collectively pool it on collaborative projects that then becomes a, a pool that can only be spent collaboratively. Um, so there's a, we want it to have a real fluidity, a real liquidity and a real diversity of um, utility that members would navigate in these autonomous ways, ways that suited their particular purposes on the platform. Um, so the dimensionality of what the, you know, what the currency is and does is important to acknowledge, I think. Okay. Yeah, so uh, one thing that comes up for me, well, two things I want to share. One is just, yes, I have, a, you know, a, quite a background in awful, um, but I, I spent the first 20 years of my life living in an intentional community. And I don't, Marco, did I ever talk to you about that? You've, you've mentioned it I to mentioned me before. It. Mm hmm I was born and raised in a commune. Um, and so uh, my lived experience was highly, you know, we ate lunch together, we ate dinner together, we did religion and prayed together multiple times a week. Uh, we worked together on, you know, um, gardening bees and, you know, chopping wood. I mean, it was just, it was very, and it was an intensive communal experience. Um, so, and, and in terms of the finances of it, my parents did not, didn't own their car. They didn't own a car. Actually, the commune owned a, several cars and people would sign them out and go for a drive and, and, and they didn't, uh, they didn't own their own home. Um, what they got is a monthly draw. So they would get a sort of a stipend and then everything else was you know, food was already paid for and provided. And so that monthly draw would be for like clothes or something like that, but not for food or transportation or rent. Those things were all covered by the commune. Um, so it was a pretty idealistic 
kind of venture uh, in some ways. And I guess I saw that both the weaknesses and the strengths of that Yeah. as I transitioned out of that into the mainstream of, you know, least Canadian society. So, um, what a valuable experience. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. So I just, yeah, I wanted to give you that a uh, little bit more about that background because I, I guess in a way that would be, I'm just reflecting right now on what, you know, would have been Ken's background and I, Ken Wilbur. And I don't think, I don't think he's ever lived that way, at least not for an extended period of time. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there can be some real challenges with that, like lack of privacy. You feel like you're, you know, you can come to feel like you're in a fishbowl. <laughs> uh, and then when people tried to transition out, they didn't necessarily have assets that would help them to do that. Um, so if they wanted to leave, then they didn't have money to go because they didn't own their own home or, or whatever, right? And their, their ownership was still there. It just happened to be, <laughs> again, you know, certain people owned more of the, the actual land or the buildings or the, you know, the, the means of production, the businesses than others. Um, so, yeah, so I would say until this conversation, I hadn't really reflected on the economic aspects of that uh, so much. So it's helpful for me to just kind of bring it out with mm -hmm. you guys. And mm -hmm. um, because it would be the kind of lived experience of, of, of an economic system that I was born and raised in. Um, you know. So, so Derwin, could you say a little more about meta narrative therapy and maybe how that might relate? Because I'm seeing that like our, our stories about money, our stories about the economic system, about capitalism or post-capitalism or what have you, are all narratives, essentially. Right. And uh, you know, we can get trapped in certain narratives or there could be a kind of clash of narratives um, or collapse of narratives. And uh, I know that there are also new narratives regarding money. For example, Charles Eisenstein's book, uh, Sacred Economics, um, and his talks and, and dialogues around that. Uh, have been inspirational to me uh, and like have helped, I think, many people think about possible new ways of existing economically in a way that would be more integrated or more uh, narratively um, uh, coherent or whole or wholesome. Uh, and I wonder if you've given that thought in terms of your own practice and, uh, and uh, you know, just life experience. Given thought about meta narrative therapy or the well, I guess meta narrative, uh, meta narratives in relation to money. Yeah. Well, in the in relation to money part, you know, I've been working, and, and we've had a little bit of struggle in our connection in the last few months because I think we were just getting to the point where we were trying to scale up, and then we hit some problems in terms of actually being able to do that with this fellow Jeff Quintero, um, who back along the way was working with Hui Lam on something called liberation economics. And Jeff has a whole model of entrepreneurship that he calls creational entrepreneurship, which is a lot like creative entrepreneurship. Um, and he, he's a brilliant meta systems guy. Um, and uh, he's worked out a model that overcomes the conventional dialectic between employee, employer, investor, and entrepreneur, and producer and consumer. So at the, I might say at the modern level, those are all um, basically uh, competitive relationships, right? If you're investing, mm -hmm. you want to get the best return. The entrepreneur wants to get you to have the lowest return so they can use the money to build the business, right? <laughs> the mm -hmm. employer wants to pay as little as possible. The employee wants to earn as much as possible. And the producer wants to sell it for as much as possible. The consumer wants to play as low as they can. So, so the, the, those six roles, um, Jeff has actually come up with a tur you know, let's say turquoise cognition or meta systems model that integrates all those roles rather than having them in competition. Uh, so he might be a good person. What's the name of the system again? His name's uh, Jeff Quintero. Jeff Quintero. Yeah, he doesn't have a whole lot out. Um, 
he's got some stuff, little bits, bits and pieces. Um, but uh, he's, you know, he's worked out a lot of this and it's just a matter of getting traction. You know, he's like you were saying, you said with the artists and the people that are innovating um, can sometimes be easily overlooked by, by people in the mainstream, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so on, on, in terms on the, on the economic side of the narrative, I've sort of defer to Jeff a little bit. And, um, and I'm sort of sharing with you my understanding of, of that model. And then as meta narrative therapy, where I've got to with that is just, we know like in from mainstream psychology that, that it's really important that us as individuals have a coherent autobiographical narrative. And people who have coherent autobiographical narratives have better outcomes on a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of variables. Um, and that includes having a sort of a relatively secure attachment status and relating to other people. Um, so, and, uh, you know, there are like assessments and measures of that out there, I think. And, um, and then, so I was just saying that that sort of, you know, narrative therapy is kind of going at that, but it doesn't really, but the, but the early postmodern move is to throw out meta, meta narratives entirely. So it's just about the individual narrative, uh, And so a meta narrative therapy would be more like a dialectic or an interplay between your own coherent narrative, some kind of meta narrative, universal narrative, and, you know, the kind of back and forth or alignment or synergy or something between those two. Um, So so that's kind of, you know, where I've I've gotten to with that. you know, so what's the, what's the universal story? What's your story, and, and 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 how do those relate? Do they relate in a way that feels harmonious? You know, that's um, constructive. Yeah, um, Carolyn, do you, are you do you want to uh, say something? Are you there? Um, well. I mean, part. I mean, one of the things that I think uh, is in play here is the shadow side of money, right? Like the shadows that we have, like psychologically and Jungian terms speaking, the the way that that the whole like that it's hard to talk about money because it's the thing that we feel most afraid about and most ashamed about, and uh, that uh, really kind of pits us in many ways against each other. Now. Yeah. Now, and, and, and so, therefore, it is important to talk about. <laughs> That's like, one. therefore, it's one of the most important things to talk about. And you can't have that sort of meta-narrative or in, that meta-narrative integration or coherence, like you're saying, uh, or that uh, coherent self-auto, the coherent auto, autobiography uh, without shining a light on that, right? So, I see it, I mean, I'm, I, I think that, I see a connection between the, the direction that you're going and the kind of thinking that you're doing and the uh, individuals you've been corresponding with, like Jeff Quintero and others. Uh, and it, and you brought, you've mentioned Layman Pascal, all quad, you know, four yeah. integral bucks. Yeah. And he has a particular way of thinking about it. Uh, so I think that those, I, I would like to encourage those conversations to happen. I would like to encourage us like to speak about that and but but i, I want to make sure that we contextualize it uh again i'm going to kind of come keep coming back to this i think in terms of like what our personal needs are about it uh and what how it really would be serving us so um like with respect to to cosmos just to be really super concrete about it like mm-hmm. i would like to be able to be economically supported uh in doing this kind of work and in being a, being a writer and in cultivating conversations that ultimately change our social, our, our social reality. Like I, I think I would like to be supported in doing that. And I would like to support others in doing that as well. And I would like for uh, as many people as possible who um, can like resonate on the, 
wavelength of that particular intention to to have the means to do so so that like our our attention and our resources our time and, and energy are going towards building that rather than just surviving doing work that doesn't really directly relate to creating the future that we want to live in so i want to see that in concrete terms and like come out of this conversation in particular with some sense of like an action step something that we could do to move that forward uh, in a way that's really resonant with what we individually uh really relate to right so um i have a, a particular or orientation that caroline you do anybody else who might listen to this will have will have that but i think we have to kind of clarify like what it is uh like what are we really talking about doing uh in the most immediate sense and how that kind of does relate to the, the, theor the, the many theoretical models and the many kind of pra pra practical um applications that are being developed like the blockchain stuff and all that kind of a thing um and I, I, uh, and I think that having like that concrete sort of doing something like moving forward on something, then suddenly is going to wait, it's going to open up all these cans of worms. <laughs> because when we start designing things like Caroline is saying, like and making rules about like, what does it mean for uh, a currency like to have demorage, for example, like, how does it actually circulate? Like, what are the rules about that? Then I think and, and people start investing in it. And I don't mean investing necessarily their money, but just investing their time. Like, you know, like as a creative project that like we do together, then, uh, then it will be really important to start thinking through our meta narratives and to start thinking about like what we really feel about, like uh, about our own livelihood and about the value of what we have to give. Um, because I mean, that's part of it for me. Like I'm, I part of cosmos part of it not the whole thing but part of it is a reaction for me to the feeling that I was putting a ton of time and energy into doing things on Facebook or doing things on you know, like in all these other ways and it wasn't coming back like it just wasn't being it wasn't being recognized and I wasn't going to benefit from it like it wasn't going to circulate in a healthy way uh and you see it all the time that like the really valuable things, the conversations that are worth having or the like the problems that are worth solving just get lost like in the chaos of everything else that's going on, everything else that people are talking about. Places right now. Sorry? I mean, so I, I want to go, I really want to jump off of what you're saying and go, go to that subtler level. You mentioned about money being scary. That's in part because the way money currently functions at large is in a model based on exploitation and based on us exploiting one another to gain, to gain at the other's expense. But, but, you know, that's not intrinsic to exchange. That's a particular way of exchange that we're really accustomed to. And to go even subtler, you, you mentioned Marco that you want to realize economic benefit from what you're investing in terms of your energy and talent into this framework. Um, going even a step subtler than that, when we, if we were to just begin using play money, pretend money, totally pretend, doesn't count for anything, cannot be cashed out for dollars yet, is entirely internal to the system. The, the exchange of that though, and again, the building of the interactions and the diversity of interactions, um, those who have accumulated this internal currency by playing what's effectively just a game, a pretend game, are going to increasingly be invested in the continuation of the game. That's what we're dealing with at a meta level in society right now is certain people with lots of accumulated power being really invested that their game keep being played. Right. And so in our, in our little system of cosmos, you know, when we play the game, if we're, if we're doing well at it, we want to keep playing, even though it's totally imaginary. Right. So I almost see that the deployment of pretend money as, as a way in to having not just conversations, but 
meaningful to the extent we attribute meaning to them, uh, you know, exchange of value um, in ways that like will lead us, will show us really interesting things about what we do value. Because right now there's things that Marco and I hypothetically intend the system to do or, you know, to value. Um, But when we actually start playing with play money, it'll become really clear what our values are. So for instance, the idea of demurrage or something that has been discussed that Marco, you know, brought to the table with Litcoin is the idea that Litcoin has no value until it's exchanged, until it's given. So it's called dim coin. And then when you give it, it becomes Litcoin. So you can accumulate dim coin from the system, from Cosmos, but you can't, it doesn't have any value until it's given, and then it becomes lit up, lit coin, right? So what is it about those types of mechanisms that we hope will change the nature of interactions in the system relative to just using cash money? That's a critical question to ask. Because in theory, we can just set up a, you know, a marketplace where we give each other cash money you know, through Cosmos, through Marketplace right now in theory, but, but we don't want to do that because we kind of want to change the rules of the game a little bit, right? We want to have different kinds of interactions that value who we really are in, in different ways than is available at the status quo, right? And we hope that such innovation will eventually, you know, influ- if it's successful, will eventually influence society by showing like, hey, we can treat each other humanely and uplift each other's best qualities and enhance those qualities and, and grow together. And this, this money is actually, this, our internal currency is actually a method for that. Um, so yeah, so just getting concrete about our rules is going to be, is going to be important. And, and whether we spend a lot of energy kind of hypothesizing and troubleshooting and modeling up front, or we just kind of like roll with our initial ideas and just in a sandbox maybe and kind of see what happens with this, this whole play money thing. I think we should focus on what it's going to take to launch a play money among even just a handful of users. It doesn't have to be all the users, but like, especially with how much Marco has invested in Cosmos that currently is completely unacknowledged. It's not tangibly acknowledged in any way, but without what he's given to this vision, there's no way that it would have reached this point in in time and space. So, you know, is there a way that we could play with the idea of representing those investments in this tangible imaginary form, this play money, And just play with the idea of, okay, what if we actually tracked that? What if we measured it? And what if we turned it into this tangible icon, totem that can be exchanged, token? That's the word I meant, token. Okay. Well, one question I have, I'm just reflecting now that my undergrad was in economics as well as in You, you keep like we keep like picking up these stones in the yard and finding all these little bugs crawling under there. You know these little life experiences that you have. Oh yeah, I just happened to like study this in college. All right, it's great. Um, I you know I would like to look. The problem is we don't have any money. <laughs> the the and. and I want people are doing stuff though. Like I'm doing a lot of stuff. Caroline's doing stuff. Wendy, people are showing up on these calls. Uh, Charles, I mean, people are doing things and contributing in the ways that they can. And like, why don't we just start recognizing that and just, it may not turn into anything. It may, we, we may always, we may never have money, real money, so to speak. But I think the idea is once you get a game going, then, I mean, then the value that we create on the whole uh, it becomes it becomes real to us in this at least in the in within the parameters of the space. And think about it like this: those of us who've invested a lot of time and energy in the system have nothing to lose if this doesn't go anywhere. We've already put that out there. We've already given. We've given because it's a gift, you know. Mm-hmm. We have nothing to lose, but we do have something to gain 
in it succeeding mm-hmm. by definition. If the game succeeds, then we have some, some now tangible value in this internal system. So we would be incentivized to play, to play the game and to play with the game, right? To toy with and play with its mechanisms and experiment. Like what happens if we, you know, if, if we apply this rule to the currency and, you know, and see what happens. So I think, yeah, it would be a way almost of tying together so, so Those that, of us who are involved actively right now um, with this kind of experimental, yeah, experimentation on this. Yeah, so I think there's one thing that I would want, I think that you would want to include in a design is in terms of the marketplace, like, like as soon as money is exchanged, that's now a market transaction, right? Okay. By definition. So... What's included and excluded in the market? I think that's, you know, like what can people sell and buy in the market and what can't they? You know, like uh, you can't sell and buy people. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. I didn't even think about this. Yeah, (laughs) I just assumed it would all be like, you know, coaching and counseling services. (laughs) Some people might have qualms no, uh, exchanging <laughs> You know, some people feel strongly that it's it's unethical to exchange wage hours. But right. then others on the site who probably really want that because that's, you know, what they... So anyway, yeah. just, yeah, the controversies around the different ways of exchanging and what it is. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. That's a really good well, question. I guess it has to be legal, first of all, <laughs> like just generally legal within the you know framework of international law and you know local jurisdiction. That would probably be a good start. Um, I think beyond that, we might need to cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, I mean, what I I mean, a first step to me would be to uh, create create a you know insofar as we have uh, play money, you know, create our our play board like what is the what's the you know where does the money where do the pieces go and uh how does the money kind of help them move on the board uh and so to me that would look like a basic like or map of i suppose like our the structure our organismic structure yeah, uh something be you've a, been working on at least a, vi- a kind of a flow chart some kind of visual model of the you know of the exchanging and then the consequences of actions in the system. Uh, we also need an origin uh, story. Uh, like how does the money get created? Uh, the, the, this is always the mystery. Always the, the secret, the secret <laughs> veils are surrounding this particular moment of conception. Right. Uh, but we want to bring some transparency to that, I think. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, and so what does it mean for Litcoin to be created? How does it, who creates it? Uh, w- uh, what validates that creation? Uh, how does that get like confirmed or how does it get uh, written into reality in some way? How does it get recorded, ultimately recorded, say, to the blockchain, but if, you know, just for now, yeah. uh, decided upon? Uh, that would be um, a good thing to, this, to know. Uh, it's just as a side note, it's, it's interesting to, to reflect that uh, Bitcoin has this mythical creator, Sa- you know, Sa- Sashi whatever, Nakamoto, uh, who nobody knows who he re- really is, but you know, right. came up with the, with the code for Bitcoin. Uh, and it just has this mysterious origin. Um, basically, you know, but, but then it, it does have a practical consequence because part of the way that he wrote the code is that it requires a lot of energy, requires a lot of computational power to actually make it run. And we don't have that, uh, obviously, so we have to have some other way of making it run. Uh, and I mean, to me, it's just made of consciousness. So <laughs> uh, share, like, shared, con- shared consciousness that it exists or shared choice to make it exist, that's the event, essentially. Uh, it's created democratically is how I would uh, imagine Litcoin to be created. I mean, ultimately, there, there, there may, um, in, insofar as it's like ex nihilo, uh, I, I, I've given it a, I've 
given a religious sort of uh, vibe and call it a dispensation. You know, it's just like comes from heaven or something. You know, it's just made. It's just, or it's given. You know, it's really given. Um, and for now, though, I mean, part of what we could do, oh, hey, Ed, um, we're, is we could just say uh, we want to fund certain things. Like we can decide uh, that we want to fund uh, certain positions, jobs, my job, social media, uh, strategic development, uh, web admin. I mean, any job that somebody is willing to do that's actually productive and that contributes to the overall purpose of the organization that they voluntarily want to do uh, and are willing to be paid fictional money for. Um, let's enable that to occur. <laughs> and, um, and then there's nothing to lose because you would do it anyway. Uh, and there's everything to gain because if we actually do end up generating value, if we do the impossible and Cosmos becomes a, you know, billion dollar company or something like that, and, you know, has established this sort of network of, uh, creative collaboration and whatnot, uh, then we'll all be rich. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then I could take a few years off and write a novel and, <laughs> you you know you could go you could do yeah i don't know you do whatever you want um but that we can trust then that the system the system will keep going uh as well uh because it will have life of its own uh as an organism as a as a social body yeah and what i think ed it's joined like us the blood in the veins right the blood in the veins of the system the organism yes hey ed are you there Derwin. Yeah. So I was aware. No, I'm that here. I had. wanted to say some things, but because you're quieter, your audio is quieter than Marco's audio. That maybe. Oh, is it? You got cut off a couple times. Oh, is it? Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Um. No, I just it was just around what's included and excluded in the market, and just yeah, and so Marco's just <laughs> saying what's legal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mean Starting for point. it to stop there. I just, I, I don't know what to, I mean, I can't imagine that anybody involved right now is going to be, I don't know, like selling. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I shouldn't assume. <laughs> I really shouldn't assume. <laughs> At a higher level though, um, uh, even what you proposed, Marco, about how about, you know, we just kind of resource jobs with this play money because if people would do the jobs anyway they would do it voluntarily but then they have this you know extra sweat equity fake money that that they're also accumulating you know even that though there's probably legal implications for an organization um to establish an alternative currency to establish sweat equity for instance i i i believe i don't know for sure but i believe that there are um, laws w with respect to cooperatives that, that kind of um, prohibit, if not discourage, the actual um, use of measured measured sweat equity in, in the economics of the organization, um, mm -hmm. in the financial accounting, so to speak, of the organization, which is what this would amount to, especially if eventually Litcoin can be cashed out for dollars. So we do need to look into that more. I have a friend who is a expert in in those questions specifically? So I will uh, I will talk to him. I'll, I'll put that in the notes. But yeah, we do need to investigate further, like what parameters we put around. I mean, around did the exchange Bitcoin app. and Ethereum do that, or did they just go in there and disrupt everything and, and not worry about it? That's what I'm. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't know. Yeah but more investigation. Okay. Hi, Ed. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hi, Darren. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Good. That's always good to hear. Where are you located? I'm uh, in Germany. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Canada. Here, so. Oh, okay. Well. International yeah. gathering. Yes, yes, very much so. You know, I like to like to do my small part. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Did we lose Marco or? He seems um, 
seems kind of so captured in time there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With a ponderous <laughs> look on his face. <laughs> okay. He committed. Oh, he'll be back, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, this was a great conversation. Uh, I, I hear I want to share the notes with everybody that I took. Okay. Um, wow, you're keeping your notes as you go. Okay, yeah, I've got some notes, but they're on paper. <laughs> That's good, too. I, t I tend to do that as well because I hate being in front of a screen more often than I have to. So let's see. Uh, you know what I'm going to do is actually copy this from the Google Doc and put it on the forum. Yeah. So I'll get that posted in a minute here. So it'll be on that. Uh, well, you guys actually have quite a great uh, kind of technical infrastructure for your, or our, I guess our, I'm a member, so aren't I? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm looking for the... Uh, have a great... The working groups where it is. Here we go, co-working space. I'm going to put it in. A new thread. Okay. Actually, no, you know what I should, uh, I don't know. Do you think I should add it to this thread? The tour to community currency or should I create a new thread? with the notes from today. What do you think? Is there a new topic? That's, that's what I'm saying. Should I create a new topic with the notes that I took? Or should I add it to the existing thread that's active? I think let's add it there. Okay. I don't think we've said anything. That really Parts from there. Cool. I did not take any psychedelic psychedelics today, but there's some kind of insects crawling on my screen, but it's and somehow inside of my screen. Really? It's very odd. It's crawling everywhere, just like a real bug. I'm, I'm trying to touch it, and it's, it's inside the screen. Um, it really looks like a hallucination, but I'm not hallucinating. I mean, I, I shouldn't be hallucinating. <laughs> but, um, and my phone died out there. So I take it that you're taking notes. And is Ed aware of what we're even talking about? Yeah. Uh, Ed, Ed will pick up what's going on as you move on. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I have no idea what you're talking about, except that it, it sounded like currency and official things and there are legal implications on anything that well, even remotely smacks of money is concerned. And and that seems to me to be very uh, typical of, of a startup on the one hand, and especially one that's trying to do something different like you guys are. So... Well, I did. I did not do a, a good job or any job of communicating the um, agenda or the purpose of this yeah. meeting ahead of time. Uh, mainly because I just didn't get to it, <laughs> and um, so this is part of the re. So, the, but what it was to be about was the idea of a community currency, which I'm, you've probably picked up picked up on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there's a thread on the forum called "Toward a Community Currency." Yeah. Uh, a aka Litcoin, or uh, I forgot exactly what the title was, but we were beginning to discuss an idea for creating a currency to uh, allow for the exchange of, of value in a way that is um, consonant with uh, the sort of overall vision of the cosmosphere of the of this cooperative endeavor. Uh, so uh, that 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 um, currency uh, would be. Um, essentially just created out of nothing, created fictionally, created as play money, as it were, uh, at least at this stage, because we don't have the resources to really finance a, a big development project and, and get a huge uh, kind of effort underway for it. But we, there's no reason why uh, amongst ourselves and amongst those who would wish to, to play uh, this particular game, we couldn't make up uh, the currency, begin to write down the rules, begin to map out the flows, and and start uh, 
experimenting with it mm. so that uh, we can learn uh, like what the effects are of the different kinds of design uh, choices we might, might make. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, through that learning, uh, when the time comes, uh, move to the next phase if, if that's appropriate. Uh, so, so that when we do have the resources uh, and can invest in the, the web development and in the legal work and everything else that would go along with actually creating a functional uh, currency, one indeed that may even integrate with uh, other currencies or the other networks may be fungible in some way, tradable, who knows? I mean, that remains to be seen. But um, when we do get to that point, we would have already done a lot of thinking about it. We would have learned a lot and we would have also customized it at the design level before spending a lot of time and resources at the implementation level. Um, we would have customized it to our own particular needs, uh, the particular people who are showing up. So, um, so this is, um, um, well, maybe we should do a point of order then because we've been now uh, just over an hour. Uh, Ed, you've just come on. Caroline, mm-hmm. you mentioned that you couldn't stay uh, for a full three hours. I don't, yes. wasn't planning on talking about Bitcoin for three hours anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I, in fact, I didn't really have much of a plan beyond that uh, for mm-hmm. today. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about. There's uh, my head is kind of swarming with things from uh, the forum and mm-hmm. other conversations and books and articles. There's quite a, I'm quite stimulated uh, actually mm-hmm. uh, intellectually. So we could, um, I, I would suggest we come to some kind of clarity on action steps with Litcoin with regard to Litcoin, And then um, maybe to take a few moments just to open up a space to, to uh, discuss what we might want to talk about uh, with the time we have remaining, what time we have remaining, and mm-hmm. uh, take a direction from there. I think there are any number of fruitful, di- fruitful directions we can go in. Uh, so, Caroline, you were taking some notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you think about I like just, next steps? Yeah, I just posted them on the forum. Um, actually, I posted a, a, anyone with the link accessible Google Doc because of the damn formatting <laughs> issues in... Uh, not issues, just different formatting language in the forum versus uh, in a document. So, um, so anyway, uh, in terms of next steps, I think, again, at a really bare bones, simple level, what might need to happen is just um, articulating, just th- throwing things out there, articulating, um, you know, as Marco said, the origin story, how do we start creating this money? Like, and who gets what out of the gate? Um, We also want to maybe decide on some preliminary rules for the operation of the currency. Just some rules about how it would get exchanged. Um, For me, a visual would be really helpful. Um, You know, since we can't actually implement little little tokens that people can exchange on the website and that have all these different features like they light up or they go dim or all these different technical implementations, even in a spreadsheet or, or some kind of visual, what, what does it look like? Or what, you know, if X, then Y, like what is the actual um, rules affecting the exchange of this currency? So just kind of, I feel like just workshopping some of that, um, getting some ideas on paper, like starting with some assumptions, starting with the assumption of uh, a particular form of demurrage, for instance, like and stimulating conversation based on that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? A spreadsheet? <laughs> what do you guys think? Um, well, one thing I know that uh, we could play with that may be a little more sophisticated than a spreadsheet, although a spreadsheet might do just fine, uh, is uh, a plugin for WordPress that is called, um, I forgot the name of it right now, uh, Cred. It's called Cred. And uh, essentially, it's a points management plugin. I have not used it before. I've researched it. I've looked into it. I've communicated a little bit with the developer. Uh, it's not, But essentially, what it allows you to do is track is to create points uh, that users can uh, have and exchange. Uh, and then there are various sort of plugins or um, like modules or sub plugins for, for that plugin 
right. that allow you to do different things with it. Uh, in terms of like uh, how it relates technologically um, to something like the blockchain, it's it's nowhere near as secure or as um, decentralized as a blockchain, for example, Be- because a blockchain doesn't depend on one particular database or one particular server, uh, you know, having all the, having the legitimate copy of the information. So uh, it it's like sense to kind of sandbox these, some of these ideas like experiment, like experiment mm-hmm. with giving Marco a thousand points and me 500 and, you know, and then just like try that and then just try something totally else. And then as we learn about what happens by watching the data of what happens, we could maybe then build, toward a blockchain build toward a more sophisticated system that's what i've been thinking about it that it would be a way of modeling uh, a, 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 a a future system so um and one that we could all interact with as well uh where you know you could have a dashboard and you can see how many points you have and you could send points to somebody else in the same way that you could send dollars through paypal to somebody else you could just do that in the system and um you know, at first it wouldn't be probably totally user friendly. It would probably, you know, it would take a little bit more of a learning curve, I think, but I haven't actually used it. Um, but it would allow us to begin to, one, model the rules and then to um, try them, like try, you know, actually act them out uh, in the context of, of the game. And I would suggest starting simple, like, just, uh, you know, a couple of t- particular things that you could do. Like uh, one is receiving coin for doing some task, right? So we create jobs for different mm-hmm. things that people are, one that all, people are already doing, recognize the, uh, the ways that people are contributing uh, time and attention. And then two, things that we recognize the need to be done uh, and, um to put out little offers for people who want to do those things and earn Litcoin. Uh, like, you know, I didn't get to uh, posting an announcement about this conversation uh, before it happened because I had other things that, uh, although, although it would have been a good thing to do, I had other things that felt to be more important. Uh, and there's only so much I can do. But if that was a resourced position, like event coordinator or communications manager or something like that, and we offered 500 Litcoin a, you know, a week for it or whatever it is, and we defined what the role really entailed, uh, then, um, then that job could be resourced and the event could occur more reliably. Um, so, I mean, those would, to me would be starting points what I think I would need is somebody who could work with um, me on the back end so that they could help with like the configuration, the admin and things like that. So somebody who is not necessarily a coder uh, don't, you know, you don't have to have PHP experience or database management uh, SQL or anything like that, let alone, you know, any of the blockchain languages, but someone who would be at least technically conversant enough to be able to log into a WordPress admin and um, uh, configure or manage the settings of a plugin and sort of do maintenance tasks and like just pay attention to how the system is working at a technical level. And uh, of course, be re- you know responsible with passwords and, and that kind of a thing, uh, that which I would uh, be um, I, you know I would help manage. Um, but uh, I, I guess in addition to that, like any, any current conf- dashboard screens or that kind of a thing, like making sure that it has the information that it needs like to, to communicate to the users. So um, we need that person because I don't think that I could do it. Uh, I think I could do it. Excuse me. I take that back. I know I could do it, mm-hmm. but it would be like months from now. And um, I think it'd be, it would, there's something to be said for just getting started a little more quickly and for uh, get, you know, throwing out, you know, putting up a little box and throwing some sand in it and getting started uh, working on it. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know who that is, but in so, you know, it, let's put that out there as one of the first, I guess, tasks is to, I mean, I suppose part of what we have to do is create the job descriptions, right. That, that we want to resource. Right. 
Yeah. And, and one of the jobs that we're going to resource is like the Litcoin sort of technical manager, however we find that role. It may not be a one-person role either. It may be, you know, people that, that uh, uh, take turns or something. Marco, I can, I can offer to help with defining the job descriptions of what we need at this present day stage mm -hmm. in the Cosmosphere, not just mm -hmm. on this project, but in addition to this project. Mm -hmm. um, and I also am happy to help with, because it's fun and interesting to me, you know, and I'm sure other folks in our circles, um, to, you know, throw out some ideas for let for, for the rules of the game and mm -hmm. let's try this and let's try that and get in this, you know, generate discussion and um, try to move toward at least a preliminary set of assumptions. For mm -hmm. the yeah. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, and I mean, in a way it sort of dovetails with the codex project as well, because the rules could be essentially they become codex pages uh, that are uh, editable, revisable. They're you know open, transparent. Uh, we can have discussions about like you know, how those rules are constructed, uh, but then they get solidified into some canonical type document that becomes sort of the operating guide for the um, for the application. Uh, so that's cool. I mean, and just starting on a Google Doc, I think is fine. I mean, that's where your notes are. Uh, having the conversations on the forum so that uh, any member can access them and add to them. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, like, as we get resourced with technical help, we'll be able to. Can I, can I ask a newbie's um, naive question? Hmm? I think I'm unmuted. Did you catch that? Yeah, please uh, do. Yeah, how, how much... I, I've seen that there was a there was a thread on the forum. I haven't been following it, so I'm I'm completely oblivious to uh, whatever you know may have been done up until now. But um, I'm I'm not disturbed. But it, it, it's I always find it fascinating when when we start talking about technical solutions to things, and I'm not sure what the thing is that, is that we're trying to solve. So I'm, I'm, that's the naive part of this. And, and since we are talking about something like an alternative currency, it may be an electronic form, granted, but it's an alternative currency. And, and those do exist in the world. There's lots of them. There are, for example, in Germany, 27 alternative currencies that are viable and being used throughout the nation. They, they are loosely related to the euro, but actually have nothing to do with them. So... People are doing things like like this. They're they're trying to find another way to to uh, reflect value for effort and 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 time spent and whatever that is, and that has something to do with just how we understand what money is and how it works and 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 you know the, those general theoretical things. And I would certainly not want to go down some abstract theoretical path. But how much? How much of that is played into to what you're trying to figure out here? I, I don't know that. That's that's the the, the ignorant side of the naivete is well, you know, how far along are you in, in thinking about well, what is a currency and, and what what could it? Yeah. I think that one of the best ways to get familiar with where we're at in this conversation would be to actually watch this recording um, mm -hmm. or to read the notes that I just posted in in the forum okay. under the same thread because. We had a really vibrant conversation on those those okay. issues. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, but yeah, we, we definitely want to draw from the best practices that are mm -hmm. out there. I, I went Gebser Gebserian on it too. We no. looked at it, we looked at it for magic, <laughs> mythic, mental. No, okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, the added incentive, eh, Marco? Okay. Well, you know, I haven't been following it, but again, you know, and and at any time, never never hesitate to tell me. To just like shut up, Ed. We already talked about that. Go look at the site. You, you can do it very directly. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings here. You know, um, just just so we all kind of understand where we're coming from. Um, uh, like I said, it, it it's it is a naive question because I'm not informed. But uh, sometimes 
sometimes the naive question helps helps those who are really involved in it uh, get a, get another grasp on what they're doing. Great. So uh, I will I'll I'll take a closer look at what you guys are doing here. And people come into the conversation at all points, and and so there's always sort of a need to kind of revisit. Uh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. Assumptions uh, and re-explain them or recontextualize them for for mm-hmm. new. Uh, so I think it's cool. Um, but do we feel at peace about the next actions, or is there more we want to add to that before we move on to the more open conversation? I feel complete about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I think where I'm at in terms of uh, providing more input you know, around that back end piece is that uh, right now I'm interviewing for a inter- like I'm interviewing for an integral psychotherapy role. And it's the first time I put myself out really as an integral psychotherapist to a potential mm-hmm. employer. Wow. So that's coming up for me um, mm-hmm. next week on the 21st. So, you know, if I'm successful with that, then I'm going to have less time. If I'm not successful, I'll have more time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, and part of what um, we're doing too is we're recording these talks. And so I, I, I don't imagine, you know, many people will want to watch them, but they will be sort of in an archive so that somebody coming into a conversation can watch a talk like this and then sort of, you know, pick you know, pick up where we may have left off. Pick up some thread that we didn't follow up on, um, and so, like, if you say, Derwin, you know, have more time, then you know, maybe you could per- further the conversation in, part- in some particular way, and maybe somebody that you know uh, who's interested in the subject, you could point them to this conversation and say, Hey, you know, I just participated in this talk. Where th- these folks are doing this thing over there. Why don't you check it out? you could help translate, you know, uh, to them. Uh, they may be able to you know, then become involved in a later iteration. But if we have the archive and then if we can get, I mean, if we can resource this, for example, get into the habit of having good notes for, for our, our discussions and uh, even transcripts, it's possible to do not great, but not totally un- unusable machine transcripts where at least you have some of the keywords and if you knew, if you know that you t- talked about something at some point in the last few months, if we could search for that, we might be able to bring up the particular conversation. And uh, maybe there was something there that's of relevance, uh, like down the road. So um, I guess that's just to say, like the participatory model that I think we're going to have to sort of move toward is going to be fluid. And it's going to be, it's going to really have to allow people to come and go as Mm -hmm the contingencies of, of their own lives play out, um, which is why it's important that we put a lot of attention into how we have the conversation so that they become actually useful um, uh, to uh, newcomers or uh, to somebody who may have been there before but then left for a while and came back. Um, so anyhow, that, that, that's, I think that that is something that we, I'd like to talk a, a little further about that um, or at least put it on the table for something we might follow up on. Because what specifically the contingencies or um, I guess moving on from the li- the litcoin piece yeah okay. and um, you know insofar as even doing something like like litcoin is going to take people participating and it's going to take some amount of coordination and a lot of that coordination is happening through these conversations and it's happening at different levels at the same time and we're we're really talking about motivation, we're talking about story, we're narrative, theory, implementation. I mean, it's, it's quite complex, actually. So, and it's a lot to pay attention to. And like even to read all the posts on the forum and respond meaningfully takes time and energy. So... Yeah, um, I've already given up on the hope of ever being able to attain that level. Being, you know, really being able to participate. I mean, this actually has gotten... You're getting to something that I've been writing writing passionately about the last two days especially just how 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 attention how energy flows through the system in the form of attention and no human being can be expected to participate deeply and really dive deep with a topic and be able to do that across multiple topics so as our topics 
in the forum proliferate, it puts more strain on us to make a choice of what we're going to invest our energy in. And, you know, yet the scattering of attention and energy is a really disruptive force in our lives currently, you know, it is, amp is kind of really present in the internet and in kind of the way the economy is right now. So, you know, we don't want to replicate what is damaging to our psyches <laughs> that's, that's rampant, which is this kind of scattering of attention. Um, but we, so we want to be concerned, you know, we want to concentrate the beam of our attention, but does that create segregated, segregated pockets of people only talking about their interests, which is kind of what has happened at Facebook with the bubble effect of only hearing, you know, the echo chamber of what you believe. So it's very, it's very complicated. And as the conversations proliferate, it really becomes a question of how are we attending to this issue um, in terms of caring for our users and caring for their experience with that. Um, so, and, and, you know, or having an ethic maybe within our community of just like understanding that we can't, we can't be involved in every conversation that we might actually have salience and relevance to. And how do we deal with that? you know, what, how do we address that issue? Um, so on that note, I do need to close my participation in this conversation uh, to move on to other needs today. Um, so yeah, I'm okay. sorry. I'd love to keep going, but that's the tension, right? Yeah, no, totally. Um, and I, I wasn't sure that I, uh, you, that I heard that I let you finish either, Derwin. Uh, you'd been saying that you're going to, uh, no, 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 has I, to be a, a psychotherapist and that you may or may not be able to participate in the technical end, but was there yeah. something more that you wanted to bring out before we kind of close this part of the conversation? And if you need to go right now, Caroline, of course. No, I just, thank, thank you, Caroline. Nice to meet It was great to meet you. And wow, your questions are really, I mean, you actually care about the users on the site? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, more than anything. That's what this is all about, my friend. It was really nice to meet you too, Derwin. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yes more than anything i care about <laughs> whether our experiences in this space are amounting to enhanced mm -hmm. lives yeah yeah so, okay so uh you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna skedaddle and I gotta walk Derwin, are you sticking around <laughs> okay all right I'm I'm see you later stick yeah. around for a few minutes just to talk because i i've never met ed so yes just to yes i i pop up at uh i've 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 managed to get some time free on tuesday evenings it's an evening for me right yeah um, i don't know exactly where you are in canada so it may be afternoon or i'm in vancouver so i'm on the west coast oh in the west coast okay i lived in california for a long time and i was kind of you're you're a little bit out of the the loop as far as the rest of the world is concerned because you have so many time zones you have to go through to get to you. So yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. Of course, the other the other extreme is being where I am, where you're so far ahead of everybody else that you're actually uh, always running behind to catch up. Oh, is that how? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel where I am right now. I was really glad that these these sessions that do come up are at a time that uh, I can I can get to. Mm. And uh, and so I pop in. We've had a couple of the last couple of weeks, and I, I don't get there at seven o'clock uh, my time because it's it's a little difficult for me. But at eight, I can, and so I'm very willing to just kind of um, drop into whatever is going on like this now and 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 see what's uh, what's happening because I, I find the platform itself in the conversations um, one of the more um, exciting endeavors that I've been able to engage. Uh, there's lots going on. There's lots of things being talked about. There are lots of things that go over my head and past my attention on the one hand. Me too. Yeah. But um, I, I guess I got started with the Gapes of Reading group last uh, last winter. That was a real good experience. I'm participating in the uh, Sloterdijk uh, reading group right now, which is a real challenging experience for me, as Marco would be able to attest <laughs> Um, but I, I find that there's, there's, I, I've always been, how do I phrase this? You're I've always been awesome. torn and fascinated by the interaction between, uh, human beings and their tools. 
And that's, that's kind of where I see that we are because all of this technology, I'm not a, a techno geek, even though I, I, I worked in the field for a long time and spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. Um, um, that's, that's not my thing, even if I, you know, come to terms with it. And um, I'm more interested in the, in the heady side of things and the, the thinking side of things. And, and ultimately, what, well, what does it all mean for us? And that, that's kind of what drives, drives me and, and what I've been able to find here in the conversation is there's lots of people who are generating a lot of meaning also about things that I have no idea about. I also like to learn. Um, I'm an avid learner. I've never stopped. Well, I don't think we can't not learn um, as human beings. So uh, that's also something that keeps me coming around. And, and wherever I, I think I can help, um, I like to do that. So um, when, when new ideas come up, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, this was all being talked about this evening, but I find it absolutely fascinating. And maybe there is something that I know that I might be able to contribute to the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm not completely ignorant of, of a lot of things simply because um, I, I, I really like the fact that you're, you're interviewing for a job that you want and that you're interested in. Because, um, in my my forty five years of working life, I never did that once. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, oh man, there are people that can do that, <laughs> you know? Because I've always, yeah, well, I've I don't always, know if uh, I can do it yet, but I'm hoping. <laughs> no, you can do it. I'm not. I, I'm convinced of that. I hardly know you. <laughs> <laughs> the mere fact, the mere fact that that one wants or is interested in doing something. I think eminently qualifies them to do that. That may not be recognized by others, but it really does. And I worked in it. I'm not an engineer. I was never an engineer. I've never taken an engineering course. And I worked in engineering for 15 years. And, and although I didn't feel at home there, I, I felt comfortable because you, I believe that we can learn anything and we can learn it very quickly if we have some basic principles that we can fall back on. And even though I'm, I'm an extremely fortunate individual that uh, mentors always showed up to help me along the way. Um, it's kind of like if you ask the question right, the cosmos gives you an answer or it provides somebody that will help you out. You just have to recognize that's what they're doing because sometimes they don't come across the, um, um, as friendly as we probably ex expect that those helpers along the way are going to be. But, <laughs> But I've I've been extremely blessed in, in in my life with finding the right people at the right time who just showed up for no reason at all and kind of helped me along the way. So that that really helped when I was in a, a very strange environment like engineering, where um, it it took me a little while to feel at home. But but you can do it. You know, um, it's it's never anything that I wanted to do, but I have a whole different understanding of what it contributes to our lives. And, and, and being in Silicon Valley, where, where there were lots of people who were overly technologically euphoric, right. <laughs> where I am, I am the ultimate skeptic when it, <laughs> when it comes to uh, technology. I think this is all, all well and good, but I really don't want to stake my life on it. And, and that's what we're increasingly being called upon to do because I know that underneath it all, it's really, really buggy. And well, I spent four years as the quality manager in a, in a medical imaging company where I was responsible for um, both about 12 hardware and 14 software platforms and, and finding bugs and knowing how many bugs there are in software. And, you know, I was one of the people that cheered and clapped when, uh, when, uh, uh, Microsoft released its first uh, platform that had fewer than 1,000 known bugs uh, <laughs> to, to, the, to the world because you're going like, oh, yeah, um, I know what bugs can do, and we don't always recognize what they're doing. And, and so there's a lot that goes on under the surface and above the surface, and and I I, I would like, I think, primarily to help people understand um, that not everything that glitters is gold 
And a little bit of skepticism is probably healthy, although I know Marco will probably go, yeah, well, <laughs> a little bit of skepticism doesn't make you a curmudgeon. <laughs> but, but that's that's actually the driving force behind all that. So um, I, I ha- I've had a very, very background. I never worked in a job I was qualified for. I've worked lots of places <laughs> in my life. And so I'm, I'm, to come back to the, the the starting point, I'm really happy that you're looking for a job and something that you want to do because I think that's that's really um, the best that you can hope for in life is to do something you want to do and not have to want to do something because you have to do it. Mm. So that was my well, tirade. <laughs> <laughs> is this something you want to do, Derwin? Is it something you want to do? Well, it's kind of, it's, it's both. It's, um, I want to do it at the same time. I sometimes, I, I have struggled in the past with some vicarious trauma Mm -hmm. experiences. Um, so, you know, with, uh, so where I know Marco from is, uh, you know, where we met face to face was an integral incubator in Boulder Mm -hmm. several years back. And as I came out of there, I came out with it wanting to do a focus on having my therapy practice uh, with men and depression, because that's really been an under addressed mm-hmm. area. Um, and so I kind of built a website around that. Marco and uh, Kayla helped me with the website and design and, and administration. And so I focused on that and you know learn some things like one it's not the easiest thing to get men to come <laughs> for therapy <Really? laughs> yeah, big surprise eh yeah no i'm not so surprised at all <laughs> no i know you're not yeah but also you know they do come they eventually yeah. did you know and then it's like or or their surviving daughters come uh mm. after they've committed yeah. suicide uh, yeah. and then, and then the issue that came up for me was, uh, vicarious, uh, traumatization. So, so I, at one point I was very, you know, I was seeing a lot of clients. It was also a corporate environment, which is part of my interest in this is mm. the corporate environment made it harder to, I think made it more likely that I was going to become vicariously traumatized trying to do that work. <laughs> uh, I believe that too. Uh, yeah, so I ended up scaling back. And so to answer your question, Marco, it's really about can I do it sustainably, like that's emotionally mm-hmm. and financially sustainable. Um, in that context, yeah, I like doing it. You know, it, it, the thing, you know, in the corporate environment, like my supervisor told me flat out, we do not do meaning of life counseling. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, okay. yeah. no meaning allowed in here. Yeah, I know. I think I work for that guy. <laughs> you know him, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been reprimanded for even talking about that on company premises during company time. So, <laughs> you were? Oh, yeah. 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 I'm not one of those people that can necessarily uh, keep his mouth shut when he asks to. I, was- I, I try very much to avoid. Um, over confrontation, but, but, but there are a lot of things that happen in the corporate world that, it, that just, they just need to be commented on simply because you can see that the, the people that you're working with are being traumatized by what's going on. And so you, you kind of have to bring it up. You at least have to address the issue, but it's yeah. not necessarily bottom line related. And if you have, if you have very, um, what I would call ideological um, supervisors, people that are there because the purpose of business is the maximization of profits. Well, then any time that you spend doing that, even though it might take you five, 10 minutes now, and it leads to, you know, 10 hours of increased productivity on the other end of it, they'll never see that because you can't get it into the balance sheet. Right. So, yeah. So you end up getting a, well, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Ed. And I go, well, I know I shouldn't be doing it, but probably not going to stop me from doing it. Um, I, I've had the great fortune that even though I've told people that if you don't like it, fire me, I've never been fired. <laughs> wow, great. <laughs> but you're, re- you're retired now, right, Ed? I'm retired now. Yeah, it's, they call it retirement. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
I mean, I, it seems one of the things that's probably changed since the time that you were in the workforce. And um, I, I, I would, I would, I'm just generally speaking, I would assume mm-hmm. this be, to be the case, not just in Europe, but also United States, Canada, uh, is that there are more sort of independent workers. There, yes. there are more uh, sort of freelancers and, and others who, even if they are like serially, you know, uh, associated with one company or another, they're not staying in one place for a long time. They're not building up a deep relationship with a particular company or a group of coworkers or what have you. And so the, the kind of existential, the existence of ourselves as, as workers or as economic beings is very different now than it was before, uh, in the sort of, you know, post-war of, Mm -hmm. uh, of Western capitalism. Um, so I, I know that I'm, I'm a, a type who uh, resisted um, uh, yeah. becoming involved in mm-hmm. the, uh, the corporate world, uh, even in yes. the academic world. Uh, after mm-hmm. I left college, I really didn't get any kind of ever conventional job. Uh, any very temporarily, I worked for a temp agency and, and you know, they stuck me in these terrible office environments and had me uh, back in that, that day, you know, working on the, on photocopies and uh, things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> faxes and, um, but totally boring, it's it, maddeningly boring work. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. sitting there just copying numbers and, uh, you know, can, tr- can um, uh, just uh, rearranging bits of information really like, no, and so I, I ran screaming from that, uh, yeah. and as a result, I mean, you know, I've, I, I um, have had to just uh, hustle uh, a living through other means, mm-hmm. just through my wits, yes. through learning um, technologies, and through uh, being of some kind of a service uh, editorially or in terms mm-hmm. of my thinking or, or what have you for you know, various people or organizations. Um, and as you were reflecting earlier, Ed, I, I, I've often experienced that I just meet the right people at the right time to teach mm-hmm. me the thing that I need to know uh, to yeah. take the next step in my journey uh, mm-hmm. through, you know, through this, this, this land. Uh, and, uh, you know, but one can only do that for so long. <laughs> before, mm-hmm. because, it, yeah. because one the, the nice thing about being in um, – a an office environment, a corporate environment, or even a government job. My dad mm-hmm. was a uh, an accountant with the city of New York. He worked there for mm-hmm. 30, 40 years. He went yeah. to work five days a week every day, but mm-hmm. he knew the deal. Uh, he he knew when to show up. He knew when he could leave. Uh, of course, he had to deal with office politics and city politics and all kinds mm-hmm. of shenanigans at that level. Nonetheless, at the end of the day, he had a salary. He had a pension. He had social security. Uh, mm-hmm. and you know, now he is, he's retired and he's living, um, a more or less easy life other than the, mm-hmm. you know, the pains of aging, a more or less e- easy mm-hmm. life in, in New York. I can't look forward to that future. I don't mm-hmm. think Derwin, yeah. may, you may have it a little bit better in Canada. Uh, certainly, uh, in Germany, you have it, uh, better there, uh, as far as the social safety net, but many people I know can't, you can't no. rely on that kind of a, a future. We can't rely on these larger systems to sustain us, um, particularly in our in when when we're at a, not when we're in our strong days, but when we're in our weaker days, when we can't work as much, when we get mm-hmm. injured, or when we're older. Um, so that's a real problem. I mean, that's that's not theoretical. Yes. That's um, no, no, that's, that's a real problem. <laughs> that's a real yeah. th- and um, I've been involved. This is how I knew uh, Derwin with other visionary, idealistic types mm-hmm. of organizations. Uh, but you know, um, many of them have achieved limited success uh, for maybe small groups of people, for teachers or luminaries or um, uh, business consultants. Uh, mm-hmm. um, certainly, like on the technology side, if you were to go, you know, if you had those technical skills, you could do really, really well uh, as an entrepreneur. But in this kind of space, for someone who's more oriented to the humanities or more oriented to the interiors, mm-hmm. uh, they're, they're, like, the opportunities are not really there. Uh, 
unless you're willing to go into a lot of debt and just hide out in grad school or mm-hmm. something like that, uh, or um, bite the bullet and you know go get a job, get a real job. Uh, and so that's why, I, like, that's why I'm doing all this is to yeah. take a chance to try to figure out some other way. Uh, some yes. other possibility uh, in the most immediate sense for myself and the people I know, the people that are my friends and in my network, uh, the other refugees from the new yeah. age, from academia and from, you know, refugees from all these other crumbling institutions. Um, and then if we're successful, then on a larger scale um, or by coordinating with others who are you know, doing their own versions of these, these kinds of experiments of which, like you've pointed out, there are many, there are a lot of people mm-hmm. who are working on alternatives. Yes. Uh, and I think part of the issue sometimes is that they don't talk to each other as much or coordinate with each other as much as they really need. Mm-hmm. To. Yeah. Well, but of course, even that talking and coordinating takes time. Um, Robert Coase earned the Nobel prize in, in economics for pointing out that coordination takes time, effort, and, and resources. And, and, and we, we can't ignore those kinds of things. I, I read a, it still sticks in my mind, but it was a very interesting paper from, out of the uh, Center for Coordination Sciences. It was at, I think, the University of Berkeley back in the early 90s. And, and um, they put out a paper where they described that in the future, um, there, were two, there were two basic economic or let's say work-based models that, that one could consider. Um, the number of corporations in the world is diminishing rapidly. And they're becoming ever larger. It's the Googles, the Facebooks, the Siemens, the Volkswagens, whatever, whatever branches they may be in, they're getting larger and larger and larger. And in many, many instances, um, their ton- turnover or their um, – uh, their revenue generated is is much much larger than whole economies of countries on the face of the earth, and the heads of these corporations are treated like heads of state, because we tend to look at things in economic terms as well, and so they they postulate that as we move on, and I I do see this uh, uh, coming to be, that we're going to have a very few huge global corporations, and they will hire people, but they are going to be the absolute minimum of the workforce. And the people who are hired by these corporations, who are a part of these corporations, are going to be like citizens of their own countries. They're not going to be denizens of some national entity that we like to think. And and everybody else that, quote unquote, has to learn a living, they refer to it as the Hollywood model. I remember when I was a kid and I watched the movie, Johnny Davis is good for throwing up clips of movies that I like to watch. And there were three screens at the front of the movie that showed you everybody's name that was involved. And then it went on and you did the movie. And now credits, I'm waiting for the movie where the credits are longer than the film that it was shown. Because every sim- single entity that contributed anything to the movie has to be listed because they need that vis- visibility in order to get follow-on contracts for what they're doing. So you have all these very small independent uh, shops doing whatever they're doing in order to survive. I, 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 I personally don't think that's a viable economic model for the future. But I, I also question, oddly enough, um, our current economic wisdom because I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's sustainable at all. But we are faced with this with this um, conundrum and and dilemma. Um, my son in law, where I live, he's an independent contractor. He has his own uh, uh, construction related work that he does. He's actually a door and window specialist, believe it or not. So anything that has to do with doors or windows or related, he's involved, and he spends. Uh, um, four days a week. He's not home during the week because he works for the most part in Frankfurt um, as a, a contract, a subcontractor for a for a larger organization that puts like shutters on on Trump Trump towers. You know all, all those screens that come up and down. Somebody's got to put them in there. They do that those kinds of things. Um, but he's working himself to death. I see how it's he's becoming physically debilitated by the heavy work that he has to do. 
and he has absolutely zero outlook of anything that looks like a pension. My daughter, who worked at the university, she has one of the few, 70, just, just to put this in perspective, 70% of all teaching personnel at universities in Germany are on time-based contracts. They are not permanently employed by universities. The only people that are permanently employed, employed at universities are administrators, and that's also the trend that we find in the United States as well. I have uh, a couple of very good friends, one, one of whom is my quasi-adopted daughter, who's a professor who happens to have a, 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 a permanent contract, but she's seeking tenure. And I have another uh, friend um, who's a, an adjunct professor who probably has a snowball's chance in hell of ever getting a position anywhere. And he has to figure out what he's going to do as well. So, so what you're being forced to do, I think, is, is part of how we've organized the world and how we've decided this is how we want to slice the reality pie. And, and we need to do a lot of, of hard and deep thinking. And that's something that you do. And this whole idea with Cosmos and this cooperative and what you're trying to do is contributing, I think, very positively to that. I wish we could get more people involved for that reason alone mm -hmm. to see that we do have to start thinking in other ways. And, and I know it's a pain in the ass for you. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Uh, on the other hand, I never really had a real job. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, I was part of the meat market for, you know, 14 years in Silicon Valley. Um, and I know what you mean, where they send you into jobs and you go, this is not what they expect me to do, but this is what they expected you to do. So, <laughs> so I also, just as an anecdote, this is not what they expected you to do. So I didn't understand that. Well, they come in there and they, and they go, well, we want you to do this. And then you go, well, that actually can't be done. I'll give you one example. I was, I got, I got hired into um, Ford Aerospace. Sounds very impressive. It really isn't. They had a contract with the with the army for some kind of uh, monitoring post that was mounted on the back of a jeep, kind of thing. Well, there's a lot of documentation and there's a lot of logistic analysis that's involved with that. As it turned out, the reason that they hired the team was um, the the company itself had failed to produce any documentation on this system for three years. And the, the Army was threatening to pull the contract, which was worth at that time about $200 million. And they said, well, we can't afford to lose that money. Um, something's going to happen. So they, they hired a team of six of us specialists uh, who barely knew each other before we sat down around the same table. And we were expected in the course of three months to reproduce what the company had not produced in three years. Well... You, you just can't, you can't do that. <laughs> you, you can try real hard and you can write real fast, but, <laughs> but you yeah, don't, no, I, you don't do it. That's what, that's what I meant by you're expected. Yeah, to yeah, do unreasonable expectation. Yeah. yeah. So there are these unreasonable expectations. Well, as it turns out, it took us six months to do it, <laughs> which on the one hand says, Hmm, I don't know what the army was expecting, but if you can do in six months what they expected in three years, why don't you just give me the money up front? I'll figure out how to do it in three months, and then I'll take the, the next nine months or 24 months off. To say. But it, that does not how it, how it works. And so, so you end up in situations um, doing things that you really ask yourself, well, what's this necessary to begin with? Because all of the systems that I worked on when I was in defense – I can tell you are unnecessary. They're not good for anything. So you were in defense. Well, yeah, yeah, defense is a whole. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I worked on uh, I, I worked on the peacekeeper missile system. I worked on when they put the missiles into the silos. Uh, by by, and you have to know this. This is I think uh, one of those fun facts. Um, as far as the Defense Department was concerned at that time, we had no nuclear warheads. We only had physics packages that were being delivered by, <laughs> by automated systems. I want a physics package. Well, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the uh, that was the euphemism, was it? It's a that was the euphemism, and that's the whole thing. The whole industry consists of euphemisms. <laughs> you know? So, wow. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you go, oh, okay, well, we'll do this. And I and I also worked on the project where they took them out of the silos and tried to put them on railroad cars so that they could drive them around the United States so that the Russians couldn't figure out where they were, you know. Unfortunately, we only had one stretch of railroad track in the entire United States that could take a 500,000 pound uh, rail car without sinking into the, <laughs> into the ground. So they kind of knew where it was because <laughs> there was only 100 miles of track that could do it. But well, I, I've done some research work on veterans health. We'll yeah. In the past. Well, and that like, that to me story. is probably the most the most necessary area. You know, I'm I'm a veteran, but I I'm not a veteran of anything. You say I avoided avoided the war in Vietnam and managed to get sent to Germany. That's why I ended up here. But um, I I do see what is done to people in the military. And I understand from the inside why they do that and why it's even more terrible than we think it is. And anybody that does anything to help these people is, is you know, as far as I'm a candidate for sainthood, my, my eyes, because we really need to be doing something there. Drastically need to be doing something there as far as these people are concerned. So, You know, I've been listening to the New York Times uh, podcast. It's, it's a new podcast. Uh, podcast called the daily it's a 20 minute um summary of the news don't advertise for other people Martin. no it's cool it's cool it's 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 uh um they publish it at three in the morning my time so and i'm often up at four or five uh six a.m and uh wow. I'll, I'll listen to the podcast while i'm eating breakfast it's sort of like taking a more this american life npr type of approach yeah. to the news of the day so it's the news in a more narrative form and the the reason it comes up though is because um, with the with the their feature story today was Chelsea Manning, yeah. and who had who's recently been released from prison, yeah. and who is beginning to tell her story. And so this was um, an interview and you know with uh, with with her, uh, where we kind of got a recap of how she ended up uh, in prison, how she ended up going from a, a he to to a, a she, yeah. uh, and really what were her motivations for that, for leaking uh, all the, um, doc, all the you know, hmm. hundreds of thousands of pages of, of, of uh, government, of military um, classified information uh, that, that she did right and kidding. like what the consequences now are for her, for her life. Hmm. Uh, and it, it, it came down to her, it seems to a real like ethical choice, a real, a real kind of dawning awareness of some a fundamental disagreement that she had with what was being done and with its not being known. Uh, mm-hmm. And when she realized that she was able to uh, access that, you know, to, to make that information available through the, through the, the, the press, uh, she faced a moral choice. Like she mm-hmm. could continue playing along with yeah this with the uh, the system and the story and the narrative or she could change it in some way and she ended up changing it in a pretty profound way mm-hmm. uh in, it, it, her act kind of inaugurated this era of leaks that, that we have where it's becoming a, a regular occurrence and a practice for uh government workers military contractors uh and others to mm-hmm. like like let the cat out of the bag as to mm-hmm. what is actually being done that uh, that the public is not seeing. And f- however that conversation has played out, I mean, it's been a you know, pretty vast and, and contentious and compl- com- complex conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something like at the, at the core of it, which is this moment of ethical choice. Yeah. And I think that like the, case of Chelsea Manning is particularly unique. It's a fascinating story. If you really, I mean, amazing, really, if you think about not just the, um, you know, t- taking that action, which, you know, is incre- incredibly uh, risky. She, you know, mm-hmm. was put in isolation, tortured. Um, mm-hmm. kept, she's been in jail for seven years. But then to go from being, um, I even forgot his name, it was Charles Manning. I'm not, oh, oh, Bradley. Brad, Bradley. Brad. Um, um, Bradley to being Chelsea in the midst of that process and mm-hmm. what kind of effect those two different um, 
transformations of uh, herself had on each other is it just as a human story is amazing. Um, but in another way, it's sort of the extreme case of the kind of choice that each person makes with respect to their own engagement with, with systems and with what you see on the inside versus what appears on the outside. Uh, and oftentimes the uh, disjuncture between those or the, the obscurity, uh, the, the um, non-transparency uh, mm-hmm. there. So, I mean, I, I think that I mean, one, one of the things with a, the, um, this sort of economic moment and what we each have to face is that we have one life yeah, as these individual beings. Uh, our, time is un, our time is limited, finite. Mm-hmm. We don't know when it's, uh, it could end at any time. Uh, and so what does our life matter? Where should we be putting our time and energy and attention? What's actually of value and significance? If you're doing, if you're participating in something or doing something that you know to be harmful or you know to be mendacious or you know to be just a waste of time, then Mm -hmm. why are you doing that? Why, Mm -hmm. why not try something else? And now many people, the 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 case may be that you don't have that many other options <laughs> that you know because of the circumstances of your particular life because of the conditions that you're in uh you may be really stuck in, in certain in certain important ways i mean Ch- chelsea's story is one aspect of that i mean to I mean, she somehow lived herself into being in the military as a transgendered person. Worst place possible, probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> and then uh, because of her inherent sensitivities, um, came to a kind of moral crux where she mm-hmm. realized that she had to do something. Uh, she had to take action. Uh, yeah. And that action would have consequences that would potentially be quite painful, um, but could also potentially be quite constructive and beneficial in the larger scheme of things. Uh, however, that, you know, is not cut and dry. That's not, um, that, that can't be, you know, predicted ahead of time or known uh, in, in any sort of simple black and white way. So I kind of see this in similar terms. Um, I, I don't want to waste my life. I don't <laughs> want to waste my time. Uh, I, I'm possessive of it, frankly. I'm jealous uh, of um, spending a lot of uh, my life on projects that don't mean anything to me or work Mm -hmm. that doesn't benefit me or the things that I care about. Uh, And yet I see that almost everybody that I know is involved in all these activities, most of which they don't actually care about. (laughs) That they're Mm -hmm. doing because... They need to survive economically, but not because they actually want to do them, not right. because they actually further something that they mm-hmm. clearly believe is a value. And that is a tragic uh, situation. And when you multiply that by the thousands and millions of people who are in those circumstances, in, in that very conundrum, uh, it's, it's just such a massive waste of human <laughs> you know, potential in life. Uh, it's unfathomable, actually. Uh, and I, th- I I don't know exactly what to do about it. I mean, we've been trying to do things about it as, mm-hmm. as uh, you know, human beings for quite some time, obviously. I mean, this yeah. is what the revolutions were all about, right? Is to create a better reality uh, that, uh, you know, doesn't require us to, to suffer for no good reason. Uh, yeah. And uh, those obviously... Um, well, I mean, they didn't achieve their their uh, original aims. I don't. I don't want to necessarily have a com- feel conversation about about the ins and out outs of that. Mm-hmm. But that. But we still. The, the, we still have to. Wh- whatever the state of the larger political movements are, we still have to look at our in our immediate con- context yes. and take the action that we can within mm-hmm. you know, with the means that we have available. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so. I don't know exactly how to do that, um, but I think part of part of what I'm trying to do is to have conversations to figure out what we can do, mm-hmm. and 
So that's where the Litcoin thing comes in. That's yeah. why I'm interested in 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 the ther- in in therapy and in what Derwin is doing as a as a psychotherapist because so much of our um, entanglement in oppressive systems mm-hmm. has to do with traumatization, and mm-hmm. we're we're kind of traumatized and re-traumatized through our participation, uh, and that um, disables us essentially, you know, psychologically from from taking healthy and appropriate and creative action. So I really see the sort of therapeutic side and the economic side and the philosophical side, which I think is about having attaining clarity of thought and mm-hmm. kind of critical perspective on our, our discourses and our narratives. Um, that's one thing it's about uh, among others uh, as all interrelated. These are all interrelated conversations mm-hmm. uh, that somehow have to come to coherence or come to, um, transparency to each other in order to take, I think, what ultimately could be more meaningful action. Uh, but how, how to scale this, how to make it sustainable, mm-hmm. how to engage others in it, how to uh, facilitate it more broadly. Um, I mean, you know, there are plenty of people having excellent conversations all over the world. And, and as you also uh, pointed out, Ed, the, part of the issue is coordination be- between mm-hmm. all those. Um, so that we don't have to kind of waste effort. We could yeah. rely on what others have already developed. Uh, we can contribute to it. There could be more of a, a sort of a meta economy or a kind of emergent economy of, of, of ideas, of tools, of um, narratives that we can cobble together into something that ultimately, you know, works better than, uh, than what we have now. I mean, uh, well, well, in terms of kind of resourcing initiatives like this, the role I tend to play is connecting, um, you know, just trying to connect people who you may not be aware of already, you know, throw their names out. I'm sort of throwing some names here as we, as we go along, mm. um, just mm-hmm. as they, or those associations will come up. Is Michael Fisher Vanessa's father? Yeah, Vanessa's father, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I quite appreciate his work on fearlessness. Um, and I just appreciate that he's been able to take one topic and, and stay focused on it <laughs> for a long time because uh, that's sort of being the opposite of me. I tend to jump around uh, a fair bit. So, yeah, so yeah, that's Vanessa's uh, dad. Uh, just to check in too, we've been on the call a couple hours, Derwin. How are you yeah. doing on time? Do you- um, I probably would want to stop in a few minutes and um, yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm committed so, to being here until the top of the hour. So if you need to hop off, Ed and I could. Yeah. And I think uh, we'll find something okay. to talk about uh, as long as you want to, Ed. Uh, yeah. My my only my the sort of habit and the practice that I'm trying to create. Uh, is yeah, to, to be available. Yeah, just to be available for a window mm-hmm. of time to have this space open and to let the conversations that want to occur occur. And, and this is then on Tuesdays generally. Yeah, yeah. Tuesday from be your time uh, Pacific time, ten to one. Uh, yeah. For me, it's twelve to three. Excuse me, eleven to eleven to two, uh, and seven to ten. Yeah. In, uh, yes, Central yes. I usually don't make it until eight o'clock on my time, but uh, where we are, well, you know, but I think it's important. I think one of the things that you uh, mentioned. I'm going to sign off right now. And okay, okay, it. nice to meet you, Ed. Yeah, Darren, it was my pleasure. Actually, I hope to see you again. Well, we'll meet each other virtually on the forum, but maybe we'll yeah, meet up again on so uh, some of the conversations. I, I'd really appreciate that. That'd be great. Okay, thanks, Darren. Awesome. Yeah, bye. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Marco. All right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that struck me uh, very much when you were were talking there, Marco, is the fact that, and it's a, it's a, it's the little saying and it's the metaphor that's been floating around the forums for in a lot of ways and a lot of places over the last uh, um, few weeks is this whole idea about thinking globally and acting locally. Because that's that's really what we're talking about. There's things going on in the world, and I'm doing things here, and they don't always hook up. But you can only ever do things where you are. 
And one of the things that that you and the, the Cosmos people are are doing is is spreading whatever that locality is. We're we're, we're becoming more. It, it's broader. It's not geographically constrained. It's not. It's not necessarily spatial in the generally understood sense of spatiality. And I think, I think that's important as well. Um, it is hard to find other people like minds, let us say, that are doing things like you're doing or trying to do things that you're doing. But it's important, that I believe, that you just do them. And, and we can let the technology and the tools and all that else we have we, we, we have to trust that it will do its part because it can't do anything other than that in bringing us together. So you get lots of people that come through here with little ideas and this, that, and whatnot. But I also think it is important not to expect too much of oneself along the way. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely mind boggled at what the little cosmos crew has been able to do thus far. I'm, I'm, Every every time I I see a new name that pops up on on the form or in the introductions, I'm just going, oh boy, okay, he's they're getting they're starting to get it. You see, they're they're starting to to move that, and it's and it's not like I know we there was also the the uh, Zuckerberg Facebook uh, discussion that was going on. It's like, well, okay, whatever. Um, he was lucky, Mister Zuckerberg. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't think he's particularly. I, I think he's a bright guy. Don't don't get me wrong. And I and I think he's, and I think he's a also a sincere person. Don't don't get me wrong there. But I think he's a lot luckier than he's willing to admit. Same same applies to the Google guys. They they were very. Well, you got two math geeks that know nothing but algorithms, you know. But the driving force behind Google is Eric Schmidt. He's a business guy. And and he's a man with an agenda. You know, the other two may not have one. I, they do, but you know, they, they may not consciously have an agenda. Um, but he has one, mm-hmm. and and he's implementing that very well. But but unfortunately for me, from the outside, I think I think the two bright guys are being used by the dummy. <laughs> I'm overstating the case. Yeah, it depends on how things go. I mean, things are things are really unfolding pretty. I mean, you know, there's a quickening pace now. Everybody's talking about yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there, there's some real, like, hand-wringing and concern about, you know, what this is really going to portend, um, yeah. not just for jobs and for the economy, but for the human race as such. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. Elon Musk <laughs> is pretty worried. He's started his own um, uh, initiative to kind of bring some uh, – you know, bring some safeguards if you, yeah. you know, into the development process. Now, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I'm not a uh, computer scientist on that level to understand, you know, the ins, the nuts and bolts of it. But I understand generally in the, the theory of singularity and and mm. the idea of machine learning and deep learning and neural networking and all those kinds of things. And yeah. once you start to think about, well, you know, just take say driving cars, self driving cars, and uh, the idea that maybe in Totally, you know, it's totally uh, plausible that within five, ten years, um, let's say t- ten, twenty years, mm-hmm. generous uh, to be con- and conservative, that um, most transportation will be automated. Uh, mm-hmm. You may not even own your own car; it'll, it'll just mm-hmm. come pick you up, take you where it's yeah. you need to go, go pick up somebody else, and it's all going to be. So the face of the world is going to change tremendously, mm-hmm. uh, yes. and. Uh, and more quickly than we probably are expecting at, at this point. Uh, uh, and, um, and that raises all kinds of problems because there's all these billions of human beings on the planet yes, there are. <laughs> who, need to, who need to be fed <laughs> and housed and, you know, yeah. and, and uh, who need to be kept from killing each other. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, so <laughs> on top of everything else, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so there are some big, some big uh, global pro- problems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the same time, I don't own a you know multi-billion dollar company. There's not much I can do on that level about things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I need to be aware of all of that. I need to yeah. kind of 
see what's go- what's emerging to the that's extent. the thing globally yeah. part yeah. right and yeah. then i need to cover my ass so that yeah. you know uh, so that's that when globally talk- part <laughs> <laughs> right so that whenever <laughs> when the systems that i'm depending on now are, are you know crash if they will if the next yeah. economic collapse or you know when the ai takes over and um <laughs> starts, you know, hacking into everybody's computers and, you know, t- launching, you know, preemptive nuclear strikes against you know, um, aliens or something crazy like that. Um, uh, we at least right. have some of our, our, our own world, you know, is a little bit more under our, our control. Um, but though, of course, um, how much so is uh, uh, maybe maybe less than I, I would be comfortable with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, we can only deal with what we have, you know, and when it when it's there, uh, that it presents itself to us. I'm, I, I'm more, maybe it's my age and maybe it's my curmudgeonry. I don't know, but I'm I'm more skeptical that we're really going to have. I let me, let me back up. I don't believe we have any intelligent systems present at the moment. I believe we have very efficient systems, and there are very AI. Um, uh, capable systems. I think we can do a lot with technology. I think this whole platform is a is a good demonstration of that. And I don't I don't consider a self driving car to be intelligent. I consider it to be functional because it it basically just does it just avoids objects. I'll simplify it to the really simplest term. All of it does it avoids other objects. That's all. Mm-hmm. And how it gets to where it's going and where it's going to go are really matters of very simple geography and requests. And I can I can punch my app and say I'd like to go to the library now, and something shows up that I can get into, like a bus, and and go somewhere, and and it'll take me there. And and it's long been known that any job that a computer can do will eventually be done by a computer. I we we also have to understand that. Um, I remember visiting a, an auto plant in uh, Detroit when I was about 12. It's the last vacation my family ever took. And my father who worked in a factory, one company, 50 years. You know, I, I've had companies I haven't worked for for 50 days. <laughs> so, <laughs> by a contrast, he can never quite understand that. But we always went to look at factories. I love factories. I think they're just absolutely fascinating. And there were 20,000 people welding and pounding and screwing and bolting and, and whatever, insulating, car, painting, putting these cars together, and they were going out the end of the assembly line. Well, about 10 years, well, now it's about seven years ago, right before I uh, re- retired, I gave a talk in uh, South Carolina at the BMW factory down there. And and they put out they put out more cars per day than that factory in uh, Detroit put out, put out in a week, and they do it with five thousand employees, and every day there are fewer. The processes are almost entirely automated. The entire welding, body modifying, painting that's all done by robots. Not there's no humans involved anymore. It's all. It's all streamlined and made efficient. Um, there's not a car, which I also found fascinating. There's not a car that comes out of that factory that hasn't already been paid for. Mm-hmm. There's, not, there's not a car that comes out of that factory that isn't going to go somewhere. That's why BMW is the largest exporter of vehicles in the United States. Mm-hmm. And they, they put up because, well, one of the things is, you can't sell American cars here in Germany because they don't meet the standards. So all of the cars, the Chevys, the Chryslers that are riding, driving around here are all made in Korea or Canada mm-hmm. because they can't be sold here. So, you know, Trump can go, oh, I'm going to, you know, they have to buy more American cars. Well, don't build shit and maybe people will buy it. You know? <laughs> so, it's, so, but it's this really is not intelligent. Cool. You're, you're, you're talking about automation. You're talking about... I'm talking about automation. Yeah. Because but automation is distinct from intelligence. Uh, so. Exactly. That, that is... Perso- thank you. That is precisely my point. So we're automating things that we thought were intelligent things. They're not. They're just automated. But the intelligence that we need to 
to make the world a livable place, that, that only, to me, only resides in humans. And so there's an increasing burden that's falling back on us to figure out, well, how do we do that? And what do we do with all these people who are not engaged in this automatable kind of work that we have placed value on that we, that we are willing to pay money for right now because of the way our current economic system works. Mm-hmm. This, is, this isn't a, a plea to say, okay, we just have to throw everything off the, you know, the edge of the cliff. But the, the point is that, that we, need, we need to be thinking very, very hard about what replaces not just jobs, but what, and what do we do with these people? And how, how do we engage them? Not, not that we have to engage them actively, but what, what do we do with people who have nothing to do? <laughs> the, the, I don't know if you've ever read Kurt Vonnegut's Player Piano. I've read other Kurt Vonnegut, but not that. Okay, yeah. But, but that, it was his very first novel, and it was about what happens when the machines take over. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating little, little, uh, little novel simply because the player piano is the model for it can play music and it doesn't need a person hitting the keys. Mm-hmm. And so we can be entertained. And it was that whole idea of what happens when automation takes, takes over. And it, it's a, it's a fascinating, I don't think he has the answer to this, but he may, he raised our awareness of it. He pointed to it and he goes, you know, we really, maybe we should be thinking about things like this. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I see that you are doing and, 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 and others are doing, but not what mainstream will say economics or political policy is thinking. They're not thinking about these kinds of things mm-hmm. because they have to support an economic system that we currently have that is probably unsustainable in the long run because in the end we're just going to have lots and lots of people with quote unquote nothing to do and we haven't we haven't equipped people this is one of the things i find um fault with with our educational system is we we eliminate all of the artistic and creative kind of things from the curriculum and expect people to learn formulas and facts and figures and whatever. But what they really need to be doing is all of that creative stuff. They need to be playing music and they need to be putting on plays and they need to be trying to write and they need to be expressing themselves. They need to be doing artistic things so that they can come to understand, well, what can I do with this gift that I've been given, which is a consciousness and a, in a, in a sense of uh, in a sense of being that it involves other human beings or other individual either other species and other objects on this planet you know we, we, we shouldn't limit it to just us and those are the things that we've eliminated where they should be included we need to be doing more than in, in that regard mm-hmm. and we're not. so any effort that we have every every attempt that we make such as what you are doing to I see promote, that other side of things, this more artistic side of things, this more, um, yeah, this artistic. Well, well, I mean, if if you have a whole bunch of people with nothing to do, the the natural Mm -hmm. question would be, what should we be doing? What needs to be done? Uh, What's really a value? Mm -hmm. And if you have all this automation going on uh, to the, to the extent where things could be produced, food could be grown, with less and less human labor, Mm -hmm. uh, thereby, ideally, hypothetically at least, freeing up uh, a lot of human energy, then what are the useful, valuable, meaningful things that that energy could be put toward? Uh, Mm -hmm. And how how could it be liberated from being captured in destructive or in um, simply like, uh, you know, um, pointless uh, activities? So, I mean, like you, we talked, you, you were in the military. Uh, mm-hmm. Chelsea Manning was, you know, was, was witnessing a, a, a war that, uh, that she found to be immoral, unjust, mm-hmm. uh, mendacious, uh, and um, incredibly uh, destructive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, what, I mean, part, part of the, I mean, we're always going to need basic necessities. That yes. as incarnate mortal beings. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
but it seems to me that the role of the arts and of philosophy of thinking itself is to think about what is needed once mm-hmm. you have those basic needs met yes. but in it i mean but that does that's not to discount the need to think to to actually meet those needs in the first place because we don't, we don't, we don't so, but so um I mean, I guess part of part of the thinking globally and acting locally piece as well is that uh, at, a, at a certain on a certain level, like we're, we're kind of like left to our own devices, mm-hmm. uh, and so we're forced to take care of ourselves. Yes, uh, we're forced to look out for ourselves. Yes, uh, uh, because if we don't, uh, we'll get very anxious about it. We'll mm-hmm. start to feel like our survival is is yes. threatened, mm-hmm. uh, and we'll start to experience you know the consequences of not taking care. If I were just to stop working and decide I don't want to pay my bills, I don't want to pay taxes, pretty soon there would be some consequences to that, uh, mm-hmm. which would be unpleasant. Uh, and yeah. it's easy enough to uh, project what those would be uh, to uh, motivate me to avoid those consequences. So, mm-hmm. um, the. I mean, I, I, I guess where I'm, what I'm trying to kind of get to is like, how do you value something that is, doesn't have the immediate value of providing basic needs, yes. like producing food or producing, mm-hmm. producing goods, but at the same time is indispensable to the very kind of, the very process of conceptualizing what a world should be Mm -hmm. what a world could be Mm -hmm. Um, and i mean that that's not to be grandiose that's not to be uh a sort of a a naive idealist uh, Mm -hmm. in in the manner of the revolutionary let's say who's going to you know completely uh, refashion society in accordance with a pre-given philosophy, like Marxism uh-huh. or what have you. Um, but it's to be practical about the connection between, I mean, it's be, I, I guess one way to think about it or put it is that it's to be practical about the multiple, the multi, the wholeness of human life. Yes. It, it yeah. includes the material as well as the aesthetic, as well as the spiritual and mm-hmm. if you, as the mental, the deficient mental has done, and as industrial civilization has done, if you divorce those sides from each other and you turn the practical and the material into this one set of activities yeah. that's remunerated uh, in, in these particular ways, and then you turn the uh, emotional, the intellectual, the philosophical mm-hmm. into this other set of activities that's remunerated or not, uh, in different ways and and separate them from each other and create these two different classes of workers and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, human humanists or or something yeah. um, uh, how do you how do you bring together those spheres of value uh, mm-hmm. in a way that is reintegrated uh, yeah. and i mean that 's part of what i'm i 'm trying to kind of conceptualize yeah. Yeah. and why we were talking about Litcoin earlier mm-hmm. uh, and why that has some connection to how conversations are, what kind of conversations we have, mm-hmm. where the attention goes. Caroline talked about this a little bit as well. And, and also how that scales to be something where, I mean, I know I'm jumping all over the place here, but I'm trying yeah. to bring together a few different threads. Yeah. Uh, where um where the actual work the value that we're putting in mm-hmm. to uh to creating a space together is represented in some way and is accounted mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. In, yeah in some yeah. way and i and 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 that's a very real problem given the situation that we're in and um i w- i was kind of uplifted um though only momentarily uh recently the uh the left party here in germany just had their their party congress and they've agreed on their 
their platform for the elections that are coming up here in the fall. One of the things that they decided that, that they wanted to work towards was they were going to eliminate um, what is called Hart's Fear, which is the basic unemployment uh, social services um, framework that has been established over the last, uh, say, 10 years or so here in Germany. It's, we still have social nets in, in, in Europe for the most part that, that you don't have in the United States. Um, we can get to that in just a second. And, and what they decided to do was, well, we're going to eliminate that financial side of the, the net, and we're going to impl- implement what they call a sustainable income. Um, every, every person in Germany would get, they're proposing 1,050 euros a month just for being there. Mm-hmm. And that is the basic income. So if you have a family of four people, then your monthly income for your family is 4,000. 200 euros, mm-hmm. which is a pretty acceptable level of, uh, of income just about anywhere you go. Mm-hmm. Um, Finland has uh, implemented this. They're also getting kind of rid of that social dependency kind of I'm going to pay you. It's just, well, you're here and you're a citizen, so we ought to be doing something. Mm-hmm. And, and what this does in that moment when, when your basic needs are met, it automatically frees up everything else that you were worried about trying to figure out, well, how do I cover my nut and how do I pay the rent and how do I make sure that, you know, my kids are fed and all those, those existential kind of things. And it's this freeing up of that, of of these muses actually, because you can then decide, I don't, I don't have to go to work. I don't have to take a job somewhere, which means that if, if somebody has a business and they, they are offering employment, they've got to pitch that in an entirely different way mm-hmm. in order to get you to come and do it. Why should you, above and beyond what you have already, why should I come and do this with you? Well, it may be because you have a good idea or a good product. You have something that is helpful for the environment. I mean, we can, we can recast this entire thinking once we start looking at at the situation, let us say, in a different way. The, 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 the path that America has taken is um, that just increases dependency. Well, there's no physical and scientific evidence to support that. Um, if, if there were, we wouldn't be paying the billions that we do every year in corporate subsidies mm-hmm. because I work for a company that only lived off of subs- subsidies. Mm-hmm. If, if it wasn't paid for by the government, it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. They would fire people before, you know, they, they, the number of people employed was relevant relative to the number or the amount of government funding that came into the, into the corporation. Well, to me, that's not very free market economy, whatever it is that they're trying to sell us, because that's really not how it works. You know, that's part of this, the, the smoke screen. So there are, there are alternative ways of dealing with this and we have to, we, we have to start very locally. Finland has tried it. Sweden is doing it in certain uh, counties, relatively speaking, within the country. Um, Belgium has is, is thought about it and is implementing it. The, 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 the link, like I said, the, the left party here wants to do those kinds of things. They're not going to get elected. They're not going to have the say. Mm-hmm. But they're bringing these, in, these kinds of things into discussion. It's interesting, I think, in Germany, one of the leading proponents of a basic income for everyone is being propagated by uh, the founder and CEO of a of probably one of the most successful um, drugstore chains in Germany, mm-hmm. because he well, Mark thinks Zucker- Mark Zuckerberg uh, talked up the ba- a bit universal basic income idea. Universal basic, uh, yeah, or, that, that's uh, the basic. And, and uh, really, when when you think about it, I mean, he should be very interested in that because it saves him a lot of money, mm-hmm. which is okay. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It's okay, but the people it gives who, people the time to be on fa- more time to be on Facebook. Uh, well, it does. And the other side of it is those people who do come to Facebook. He eliminates one big problem. How do I find my really motivated employee from the people who, from the person who just wants to get fat off of me? Mm-hmm. See, that's the other side of the employment uh, uh, dilemma that we have. That means he has people who want to work at Facebook because. It's above and beyond anything else I do. I'm doing it for the fun of it. 
Mm-hmm. If you pay me in addition to that, then I have something extra and I can go on vacation. I can do this and that. That's, that's great. Because there are ways to organize our financial system because it's all made up anyhow. Um, when you get, that's why I was asking about the you know, financial systems are, are, are probably the most abstract, uh, irrational things that we've ever come up with, um, that you eliminate a lot of that. Because it's not about whether I have to, it's because I want to. And everybody wants people who want to. Mm-hmm. That's what every company wants. And so if you want, and we, we have basic necessities and they do have to be met. And there are people, I know a couple of, I live in a very rural area. I know some very, very dedicated farmers. They would not, for any amount of money, do anything else. Because they like farming. And I'm glad they do it. I'm glad that only 3% of the population has to, because it's a whole hell of a lot of work <laughs> when I watch what they're doing. But they love this. And so, so we, can, we can combine these things and what we need to do, what we have to do, what we want to do, and what is possible in ways that, that are beneficial to a, a much wider range of individuals and, 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 and parts of the population that we're, than we're doing right now. We simply kind of painted ourselves into a corner with our current economic models, and that forces people like you and all the people at Cosmos and others in similar situations to think, well, okay, well, I do have to survive. But, well, why do you have to survive? You're here. <laughs> and we, we have, and the thing, and this is the th- part that aggravates me, this is where I get a little curmudgeon is we have the technical and, and, and otherwise wherewithal to make sure that everybody can survive, but we don't do it. And that, that's where yeah. I see Chelsea Manning saying, well, there's a lot of things we could do, but we don't, and that's not right. Mm-hmm. And she pointed to the very, I believe, critical point of this and said, this isn't necessary at all. I found it extremely distressing that she was um, sentenced for as long as she was because she really didn't disclose any highly classified information. Mm-hmm. Some of it was classified, but I can tell you, yeah. I can tell you stories about classified information make your hair stand on end. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> because I worked in a business that was that dealt with classified information. Yeah, I don't know all the details, of, but I know it was embarrassing information. Uh, that... it's, well, that's the thing. It was embarrassing. It wasn't that it was destructive or it was harmful or that it was going to threaten the national security. Trump threatened the national security by orders of magnitude more with his little meeting with the Russian whatever's they were when he was, was, was spouting things out than Chelsea Manning did with, uh, with her disclosure. Mm-hmm. But it was, you hit the, you hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. It was embarrassing. Mm-hmm. It's embarrassing that we think these things are important when we realize, my God, this isn't important at all. Mm-hmm. So, Okay. Um, I've been on the line now for almost three hours. Yeah, I know. I you should be about ready to fall over. I'm, I'm ready maybe to have some lunch. Or, I or think that's a good like idea. Um, lunch is a good thing. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I feel like there are a lot of things to talk about. Uh, mm-hmm. And there are these multiple topics now on the forum there's a conversation with Sperry. There's a conversation about Facebook. There's a conversation yeah. about the blues. There's a conversation about, about Spears. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I, I'm, uh, one of the things I've been trying to think about is how do they tie together? How do they fit together? Where, where's it all, you know, how, where's it all mm-hmm. going? I, it's going someplace. I know it's going someplace, oh. but, um, like where where are the points of synthesis? Like what are we learning, you know, from yeah. the from these exchanges, and how can we build on what we what we learn yeah. so that we go from a sort of the sort of lateral um, scenario where we have a lot of things going on uh, to a more vertically integrated scenario where those things are kind of feeding into In the, uh, more substantial, more concretized uh, yeah. types of 
um, either initiatives or or actions or or further conversations. Just to, you know, mm-hmm. once once you, people come to an understanding on something, presumably then they can move on to other things that they don't have understandings on, but with that under, that mutual understanding secured. Um, one thing, um, I was going to bring this up before. Uh, I mean, what, one thing that, that, that I think has been a theme is that um, this kind of like what is in common, you know, mm-hmm. and how do we determine like what that we're even talking about the same thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that um, that we're doing so in a way that we're that we're each, that everyone's being heard to their satisfaction, mm-hmm. uh, and and also that there is transparency as to what we're bringing to it because we all mm-hmm. project our own. Things, our agendas, our concerns, our fears, our shadows, our traumas, etc. Mm-hmm. It all is kind of tends to get mixed in the, into the space, yeah. and it takes time to unravel, to disentangle those all those threads and how they get. You know, they don't come out fully, fully self-clarified. They don't come out fully differentiated. They, mm-hmm. they tend to be used and con- conflated and. Um, and and I'm wondering, even from just a practical level, like how how to how to better do that, how to, mm-hmm. how, to how to better sort of conduct or guide things into a more synthetic, a more um, useful uh, direction. Uh, I have all kinds of ideas, but mm-hmm. I can only act on some of them and not others. Others, uh, I um, you know, may have the idea but not the capacity, mm-hmm. uh, and. I, I, I'm fine. I'm, I'm finding that it might be important for me to d- communicate the tensions that I feel mm-hmm. around um, just the the dynamics between having many different conversations and uh, the the ways that con- that you know that it asks something of you to keep up mm-hmm. with it and to uh, to add something to it. Uh, so if I can highlight that that tension. Maybe others feel the same thing. Maybe they maybe they have some ideas that I don't have, uh, and uh, maybe there's some way we could we could kind of bring bring perspective uh, mm. to what we're doing uh, on the whole. Mm. You might have some ideas. You might have some yeah. views on that. I I, 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 don't, I don't know if you've ever uh, read Order Out of Chaos by uh, Ilya Progeny. I think he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the the idea that, that chaotic systems tend towards order. I know that we like to think of, you know, entropy and it all kind of breaks down into chaos and whatnot, but there are, there are forces and, and tendencies in the universe that work in the opposite direction, oddly enough. And, and I find that very encouraging. So out of this chaos, and I know that you're feeling a lot of chaos, there can come order. And I also, and you recognize as well, you, you can only do so much and you can only try so hard. But when things get really critical, I'm not advocating this as a, as a method that everyone should follow in life. But oddly enough, when there's, there's an old saying in esotericism that uh, when the student is ready, the master will appear. And so there's always somebody that pops up <laughs> with something, and it might be very temporarily, and it might just be for a small, you know, few steps along the path before you you know, they take off and they go somewhere else. But I think what's absolutely essential in all of this, and it's a word that you brought up in our, in our uh, you know, bubbles discussion, you have to have faith. And, and faith, <laughs> I'm not sure it's just aesthetic or whatever. I, I like the fact that you brought it up as a, as a notion that could be kicked around in that context especially in regard to slaughter dike where I have no faith in it. That, and I find that, well, well, that, see, that was one of those times where, well, that's good for me because I hadn't thought of it in those terms. And I, I had never would have expected that that word would be used in this, in this way. So, so I think it, it sh- I don't think it's 
proof of anything, but I think it's indicative of how things in life tend to work. That when you focus enough energy on something, you focus enough thought, and you focus your, your, your being on something, when you need help, help shows up. We don't always recognize it when it comes. Well, I, I'm the first <laughs> to go, well, if I had only been thinking, you know, to, you know, I could use that a lot in my life, but it does come. Mm-hmm. And it comes because we want it and need it. So we, we have to have a certain amount of faith. We have to know that there are principles in the universe that are supporting us even when we don't recognize that they're there. And I think that's, that's kind of where, where maybe you are. That's kind of how I see the platform at the moment. You know, I, I'm, you know, as curmudgeon me, uh, as curmudgeonry as I am, I, I, I feel very positive and good about what's going on here. You know, not, not, not the least of which is because it tolerates curmudgeons, you know, <laughs> No. I actually had a suggestion for you. This, this, this came to me in meditation, so, oh, yeah. so I take it as a, um, a, a transcendentally delivered message. I'll take it as it's intended. Uh, I wanted to suggest that you write a poem uh, in, in response to, uh, to Peter Sloterdijk. Uh, oh. Yeah, if you, if you could, all, all your curmudgeon thoughts, <laughs> you could condense them into a, a poetic utterance. Mm-hmm. I, I'd be curious what that might be like because I recall the poem that you wrote on the Greek amphitheater, uh, yeah, and, and the uh, the rites of Dionysus, uh, yeah, in, in uh, while we were doing this the Gapes yeah. reading, yeah. So uh, I wonder if there's some way that that you could bring your whatever roiling discontent that you, you you have that might lead you to throw the book across the room. Okay. Or you know, commit other uh, acts of um, of curmudgeonry. Curmudgeonry. Uh, could, could, could those could those could those um, find poetic expression? I, okay. I, I wonder. All right. Well, I'll, you've you, you've thrown down the gauntlet. I'll you know, I'll pick it up. What the hell? <laughs> well, you know, it, it actually maybe it, re- it relates to prob- what I was just t- saying earlier, uh, which you reflected back to me beautifully, um, and and that's. The, the synthesis or, or some, some kind of mm-hmm. order out of chaos. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I would love to see that. You, of course, you don't have to. If it doesn't no. arise, it doesn't arise. Um, but I wonder, I wonder how, uh, for, for all the uh, agita that mm-hmm. uh, Slaughterdike has, has given you, <laughs> there might be some way to turn those, those lemons into lemonade. It's a lemonade or whatever. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think about those kind of metaphors all the time. Cause you know, it's, it's, this is, this has been for me, this whole reading of Sloterdijk has been, has been uh, um, enlightening is the wrong word because I'm not anywhere close to that, but it has been so informative for me, you know, mm-hmm. on, on how, um, because there are, there are things that I, I feel very passionate about, and I, I really love Gapeser and all that kind of stuff, but he never agitated me like this. And I, I take agitation not as a, a negative thing, actually. I, mm-hmm. I think it's good because I think we need to stop and think about, well, okay, why, why is this guy pissing me off so much? <laughs> you know, Where is he getting under my skin? Why, why is it that I'm so upset about this? And that's why I keep thinking, okay, well, maybe in the next chapter, <laughs> he'll, re- he'll reveal uh, what, what that is. You know? But he's very elusive, I have to, I have to admit that. He's, very, he's a slippery character. He's, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's, hard, he's hard to pin down. But I'll, I'll think about this one. Okay. I, I'll think about this one a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe it's just like kissing frogs or something too, where you know it's something that glitters but it's not gold. Uh, yeah, it could be. Yeah. I'll, I'll think um, about this. This is a this is a good. Uh, no, not not the poem, but even Sloterdijk itself. I mean, maybe yeah. there isn't as much there as I thought there was. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, I, I think as long as people are getting things out of it, there's something there. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not none. Nobody in the in in the group. And nobody that I know that's reading him is making anything up. So mm-hmm. there isn't there is that re- real 
existential connection. That's there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's valid. I, I don't think we can discount that just because I don't see it. Mm -hmm. Just because you don't see it the way I see it. That's there. So we can't, we can't ignore that. But mm -hmm. it could be lots of things. Mm -hmm. I'll reflect on that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. Then I guess we're almost yeah. at the top of the hour. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty it's done. Really I yeah. think I'm ready to conk out or have a siesta, maybe. Uh, have siestas, are nice. siestas are good. Siestas are good. Um, and uh, yeah, next, next week I'm going to be talking with Greg Thomas. And we're going to record a, more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, discussion about the cultural critic Albert Murray, who he's written about. He was a, a Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, an interesting article. Yeah, and um, so I think that'll go good. I've been doing my reading. I get oh, to listen to some music. I'll get to listen to some good music this this week right. uh, in preparation for that. Um, so I may not do uh, a more public conversation because he'd like to just do a one on one uh, on the on the topic itself with you know somebody's read like somebody's done the homework. Yeah basically which which i've done if, if he doesn't mind eavesdroppers i'd love to eavesdrop on something like that i'll check with him i'll check okay. with him and um uh maybe i, I do want to have a more structured like have some questions laid out yeah. and treat it more yeah uh, like a formal interview you yeah. know let it, giving him the space he needs to yeah. Yeah, say yeah. a few things like we have some specific things to talk about and um things that relate here as well uh like what we were just with regard to irritation and the value of being irritated. Is that the yeah. grandson? Why don't, you, why don't you say hello? Oh, cool. Say hi, Marco. <laughs> Can you say hi, Marco? Hi. Just say hi. 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 <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> What's his name? Yeah, uh, yeah. See? So I was just talking to to Marco, and we're gonna we're gonna sign off now. But you say hello, so you get your noogie back. Uh, yeah. All right. So we're gonna we might we may talk about agoni antagonistic cooperation, uh, ah, for example. Okay. Uh, that that I think is a an interesting topic. Kind of relates yeah. to this productive irritation that 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 we're talking about. Um, Critique is another thing that I think is interesting. Being a cultural critic, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, and the value of, criti of critique and criticism. Critique, I mean, that's yeah. one thing that's, that is, uh, we have a lot of bad ways to do that. Actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, figuring out how to do that more, more, gen more productively, gen or supportively, appreciatively, generatively, uh, that, that, that might be another thing that comes up. So anyway, I'll talk to him. And okay. um, that's good. And if it's going to be open, I'll 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 let that be known ahead of time. All right. Uh, other than that, I appreciate you showing up. And okay, um, it's been fun. Yeah. Again. Same here. All Take right. Care. Bye bye. Take care.